meeting of the Senate Finance Committee will come back to order. <clears throat> Mr. Muir was speeding through the spreadsheet, and I think he was just turning on to page two. Um, Mr. Chairman, yes, I was on page two, and we had just finished going through the, the change items um, for Department of Commerce General Fund. Um, so I will jump down to line 97. That shows the, the total general fund appropriations um, for the Department of Commerce Energy Division. It's 140.189 million, and that is 129.5 million above the base. And then the tails, it's 13.4 million. The next part of commerce that this bill has is the Petroleum Tank Release Compensation um, Board. And that is on line uh, 101 of the spreadsheet. There's a maintained current uh, operating increase of $61,000 to this uh, division of commerce. And th that amount comes out of the petroleum tank release fund. And that was a part of the governor's initiative. And that is the only change item for that division of commerce. Next, I'm jumping down to line 30, 135 of the spreadsheet. There are two other agencies that are, have appropriations in this bill that aren't part of the base budget, but are, are, do have appropriations in this bill. One is for the Department of Agriculture. There is a Green Fertilizer Production Facilities Grant Program in the bill, and that is funded at $12.89 million, that's on line 135. And then there are two appropriations to the Department of Administration. On line 139, it's for new energy guidelines for state buildings, $690,000. And line 140, there's $500,000 for a construction material uh, mm -hmm. environmental analysis, and there's some language in the bill that ties to that. Um, so that are, those are the change items in the bill. The rest of the, this page of the spreadsheet just summarize the revenue changes that are being assessed at the PUC. That's on line 146 through 151. And then also the revenue changes that are being assessed at the Department of Commerce on line 153 through 159. If we jump to the next page, again, that just shows how we meet our target we covered this when, when we started. There's um, $148 million of spending on line 173, about $8 million of general fund revenue changes for assessments. That nets out to about one, to 140, mil, 140 million, adding the 115 of, that was spent on chapter 24. That gets us to our target of 255 million. The last part of the spreadsheet it deals with the renewable development account. And this is in Article 2 of the bill. So these are the last two pages of the spreadsheet. It's a front and back. Um, the renewable development account has a balance going into the, the, what we're showing here is the forecast and then the Senate columns. The governor did not have any uh, change items relating to the renewable development account. So the amount of, I'm showing the, a balance on line 10 in the renewable development account of about $96 million of, in February 24 available. Um, the changes on the Senate bill, and I'll, I noted many of the items already on this spreadsheet because we had both general fund appropriations and RDA appropriations going for some of the same projects. So I'll just note the projects that are funding, that the funding is coming from the RDA only. Um, the capacity, there's an increase to a appropriation that goes to the University of St. Thomas Microgrid Center. Um, they, they had a base appropriation of $400,000, of $1.4 million. That is increasing to $3.4 million, so that's a $2 million increase. And then there's also um, $4.1 million to them for, for a federal match. The other one I'll note on line 26 of the RDA spreadsheet is the Granite Falls Hydroelectric Facility. 
uh, $2.4 million. That's to repairs to the Hyd Granite Falls hydroelectric facility. Line 30, <coughs> excuse me, is $3 million for uh, solar for Area C contingency. This is uh, money being put into a contingency account, and it deals with the, the former Ford plant site. And to put solar on there, there, they need some money put into a contingency plan in case the PCA, after evaluating the site, has some mitigations that are needed. And if this money is not spent based on a PCA um, review, it will cancel back to the RDA. Line 32 is the Emerald Ash Borer Biomass Dehydrator for $2 million. Line 33 is 10 million for energy storage incentive grants. And then I'll jump down to line 36, um, $5 million for solar in public buildings. So the total amount of new appropriations to the Department of Commerce from the RDAs on line 39 is 56.1 million. There are two other agencies, or one other agency that is receiving a new appropriation out of the, the RDA, and that is on line 46, the, uh, $5 million for, to deed for the Energy Transition Grant Program. This is a statutory program that um, gives grants to communities to help them um, plan for and recover when a, a energy production facility is closed. Um, deed puts general fund money into this program, and this uh, Bill puts RDA money into this program. I'll jump to the next page. The total amount of new appropriations from the RDA on line 76 is $61.1 million. There's also, uh, and when Mr. Stanley notes a couple items in the bill, an additional amount that is being reserved for solar rewards. And that is it for the spreadsheet. And I'll turn over to Mr. Stanley, who has a couple of items he's going to point out in the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm just going to hit on a couple points in the policy article. Um, and before I start, I'll note that there's a summary of the policy articles. That's Article 3 and 4 in your packet. If you, if you want to uh, know more about the sections I don't mention, can also try to answer any questions you have uh, once I'm done here. The first thing I'll bring your attention to is section seven on page 36. And you'll see on lines 19 and 20, this is the language that Mr. Mueller just alluded to, providing for an additional amount for the solar rewards program in years 23 and 24. You'll also notice on lines 21 and 23 of that same page that of these amounts, Half in each year has to be reserved for solar energy systems owned and constructed by persons with limited financial resources. The next uh, section I'll draw your attention to is section 22. This is at the bottom of page 46. This was added via amendment in the Energy Committee, and it requires the commissioner to report to the legislature annually on each account in the special revenue fund created in Chapter 216C. Uh, this bill creates uh, several accounts uh, there, and so those that are created in this bill, as well as those that are already in statute, would be subject to this new reporting requirement. The next set of changes I'll draw your attention to begin on page 54. These are some changes dealing with the Community Solar Garden Program. Uh, the very first a uh, set of uh, words I'll draw your attention to are in the middle of the page, starting on line 17. This creates a new class of community solar garden called a low-income community solar garden. At least 25% of subscribers would have to qualify as low-income households, and only certain types of non-residential subscribers would be eligible to participate. You can see that list on page 55, lines 17 through 25. And a low-income community solar garden could have up to three megawatts capacity under this language. And then you'll see on the next page, page 56, lines 6 through 10, 
a requirement that all new solar gardens after August 1st, 2023 be low income community solar gardens. The next change I'll draw your attention to, Mr. Chair, is at the bottom of page 56. This creates a new distributed solar energy standard requiring that by 2030, at least 3% of the public utility subject to 116C.779's total retail electric sales would have to come from solar devices that have a nameplate capacity of 10 megawatts or less, and uh, they would have to have been constructed after August 1st of 2023. The utility could own no more than 30% of that capacity. And those are the provisions I wanted to mention to you, try to answer any questions you have about other provisions. Thank you very much. Um, Sir Friends, you ready for questions and stuff? And as well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Chair, I have some amendments I thought I would throw on to this bill. Okay. If this is the right time, and I'd like to start by offering the A23 amendment. A23, that's in the packets, it looks like? I believe so. Is it? Yes, it is. <clears throat> getting double printed. Go ahead, Senator. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Members, the A23 discusses the intervener compensation program. For those of you that are familiar, the Public Utilities Commission allows for interveners to be compensated if they have a successful intervention. So let's say ratepayers down where Senator Draham and I live um, are faced with an intervention. That intervention is successful. The PUC rules in the ratepayers' favor, and the ratepayers save a bunch of money. The intervener comp proposition is how those interveners can claim reimbursement. They have to meet a number of criteria, including that they materially assisted and that the intervention was successful. What's before you in the A23 is a modification and a piece in the valley, if you're okay with that term, between the Citizens Utility Board and some of the labor organizations that are watching the intervention. And so this represents compromise, compromise in a couple areas, the dollar amounts that can be claimed and the types of PUC docket that can be intervened on. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to answer questions about the A23. Questions on the A23 amendment. And, and you, you said that the advocates were on agreement on this sort of... <clears throat> I would be happy to elaborate, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, stakeholders were equally uh, lukewarm on the compromise they reached as they had to be dragged kicking and screaming the last 10 yards to the goal line. Um, in particular, on the question of a sunset, uh, members are interested. This will sunset after five years. What that means, of course, is that we're going to have this policy, see how it works, and if a future legislature wants to continue it, they'll have to do that at that time, um, among some other provisions that were true compromise, Mr. Chair. Further discussion on the A23 amendment? If not all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Then, Mr. Chair, I have the A30 amendment, which I'd like to offer. Do others see it in their packets? No. I have copies of it. Okay, if you've got copies. I'm assured, Mr. Chair, the A30 is in the packets. Okay, I may not. Members, is it there? Some have it, but you might make sure. Okay. What? Some do have it. Thank you. Raise your hand if you don't have it. Well, they're coming around, so you'll get two or three copies. A30. A30? Yeah. 8.44 a.m. 8.44 a.m. One of them says 8.40 p.m. That this, might be... This is for tomorrow's bill. Oops. Or I mean, this is for the later bill. This is for the later bill. So this is for the energy. Okay. The one that's 8.44 a.m., yes. Yes. Um, Senator Friends, you may 
Go sure. ahead. Um, members may be familiar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Members may be familiar with the benchmarking. This is where we're collecting data, we're aggregating it, and we're spitting it back out to try to assist in future building. The A30 amendment represents some changes to the benchmarking portion of the overall bill. Um, it is not controversial and have had no known opposition to it. Having said that, it's somewhat detailed, and essentially this is information that's going to help us build things with less carbon. Happy to answer questions, Mr. Chair, about the A30. Are there any questions on the A30 amendment? If not, Senator Friends moves the A30 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? Prevails on a one to zero vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. They don't ask uh, how, they ask how many. All right, uh, members, I hope you'll consider uh, the A32 amendment. With that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A32. That is in the packets, I believe. It's as in the packet as the A30, Mr. Chair. A32, members. Okay, go ahead and explain that. Uh, members, this is simply a shifting of $9 million from one category of the underlying bill to another. As many of you know, um, those of us in greater Minnesota have an interest in some renewable energy concepts that involve green fertilizer. This takes um, $9 million from the energy storage provision earlier in the bill and simply switches it to the green fertilizer. So in a sense, what I'm saying with this amendment is um, having looked more closely at some of the choices made in the bill, I kind of like green ammonia, and I think it offers us some potential. And for that reason, the A32 amendment simply shifts $9 million. And I think that's a better approach to the use of our target, Mr. Chair. Is there any discussion on the A32? Oops. Make sure everybody has it. Okay. Um, any further? Senator Dames. <clears throat> it's, we, apparently it's been some packets, but not others. It could have been picked up when they were cleaning up. <clears throat> Senator Murphy, did you have a yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair and um, Senator Frentz. Can you just say a little more about the shift? Sure. I, it's in your bill, and I, so I'll help clarify, please. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the amendment shifts $5 million of the original $10 million and then takes another 4 from the Renewable Development Account for a total of 9 to go towards the green fertilizer, if I'm getting your question correctly. Or did you want um, why I did that? Mr. Chair, um, it'd be great if you wanted to say why. Thanks. Um, well, a couple reasons. First of all, just balancing the various uh, merit, if that's the right term, for storage versus green fertilizer. And having had some conversations about the upside mm -hmm. of green fertilizer, including with our talented, hardworking Senate Agriculture Chair, Eric Putnam, who shares my interest in that. Um, and with the availability of an additional $4 million that we had sort of on the sidelines on RDA, made that choice. No disrespect to the storage, and I'm still optimistic Americans can innovate in battery storage. Further discussion, A32 amendment. <clears throat> Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Friend, so if I recall from my time on the, on the Energy Committee, the RDA is... Uh, a surcharge placed on Excel customers put in into the account. And I'm looking at this for green fertilizer, trying to figure, I'm trying to make the connection between green fertilizer and energy. Happy and to you help could, you make that, Senator thank Pratt you. and Mr. Chair. Renewable, uh, grow it. Uh, same theory I would offer you as uh, biodiesel, except for we're going to use that to create energy so that um, green fertilizer is a concept. These are for facilities that are going to manufacture green fertilizer. And in committee, we had some testimony, including that from the University of Minnesota, that have some optimism that we'll be able to do that. Um, I am not a scientist, as you may remember. And so if I have to get more scientific than that, I have to phone a friend. Sure. Senator Pratt. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Senator Frentz, I'm still struggling to make the connection, right? I, I get that we want to create green fertilizer and help our agricultural committee. I'm trying to figure out how this is going. Are you saying that this fertilizer is going to be used for biodiesel? Is that the? No, I'm saying that it comes from renewable. Um, but I, I'm going to have to get some help up here if you want me to. Perhaps Mr. Stanley can jump in there, although I can't say for sure. Mr. Stanley. Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, um, if you look at the language uh, in the bill starting on page 112, section 47, you can see where what is exactly happening with these grants is located. I'm going to share that with you. Senator Pratt, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Frentz, how much is going to be left in the RDA after, after we... Um, do all the appropriations in your bill? Well, as you know, Senator Pratt, we started with 90, the February forecast at 96.1 million, and I'm just about to say the exact number that if this bill were passed in its present form, we are going to have left, and I think 30. Mr. Mueller's going to say it for me, although I could have said it if he would have just told me the number. Um, Mr. Chairman and Senator Pratt, um, there'll be about 30.2 million left in the RDA after fiscal year 25, but then it renews again to the tune of about another um, $36 million again in fiscal year 26 and each year thereafter. So all the appropriations in the Senate bill out of the RDA are one time. So it brings it down to, like I said, about $30 million at the end of year, fiscal year 25. Yeah. Um, there are some additional amounts that will go out for um, the solar rewards, but those go out throughout the year, so we don't count those all in one year. But it goes down to about $30 million and then renews again in fiscal year 26. Senator Pratt, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so Mr. Stanley, I'm, I'm looking at the original language and trying to reconcile it. So... What we're saying is we're, we're creating green fertilizer from renewable energy, and that's the linkage back to the RDA, when the RDA is really meant to be about um, developing new energy sources. Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, I think the connection with energy here is, as Senator French said, it has to be created using the enumerated renewable energy tech and uh, hydrogen produced by splitting water molecules using, you know, various enumerated wind or solar facilities, electrolyzers connected to wind or solar, grid-based electrolyzers that have matched their electricity consumption with wind or solar. And so I believe that is the language that you're asking about. Senator Pratt and then Senator Dreheim after that. Uh, I'll defer to Senator Dreheim. Senator for now. Dreheim. Thank you, Chair Marty, and, and thank you, Senator Frentz, uh, for the amendment. Uh, just a quick question. I, I know uh, fertilizer has been extremely expensive, and uh, we, we've had discussions about that in the past, uh, about input costs to farmers, and et cetera. With this green um, fertilizer, um, will that lower the cost of fertilizer? Mr. Senator Chair, Frentz. Senator Draham, you've just crossed over, and now I'm going to have Mr. Lurie from MFU. Yes, uh, not only that, but we're going to be making this fertilizer, not having to drive it anywhere, simply applying it. But with your permission, Mr. Chair, for someone who knows more uh, and sounds smarter on this topic, not just to cost Senator Dreheim, but to how they do it, like electrolyzer. I heard that. My eyes started to glaze over. Um, I'd like to welcome Stu Laurie from Minnesota Farmers Union, Mr. Chair, just for some very brief testimony about how this works and how much money we're going to save for our farmer, Senator Dreheim. Mr. Lori, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Marty and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Stu Lori. I'm the Government Relations Director for Minnesota Farmers Union, and I've had the honor to work on this uh, green fertilizer production incentive with, with Chair Frentz. And to your question, um, Senator Dreheim, uh, really what what uh, green fertilizer can provide is a more stable price for fertilizer over time. So what we've seen uh, with the fertilizer markets, of course, in many parts of the state, um, last year for uh, fertilizer 
uh, uh, doubled, went way up in price. It's now uh, uh, down of, of, of late, but what um, green fertilizer can provide is that really stable price. So what we can say right now, particularly with the hydrogen production tax credit, is that this will be cost competitive with conventional fertilizer. And it also, as Senator Friends uh, so well said, um, relocalizes those supply chains um, and helps uh, create that local resiliency that our agricultural community needs, knowing that they have that uh, fertilizer pr product produced here locally instead of in the Gulf or overseas. Thank you. Senator Dames. Uh, Mr. Laurie, so you're, you, you stated that it would be <clears throat> cost competitive. So if we weren't subsidizing and putting this money in, how would the cost compare then to the fertilizer we're getting today? Mm -hmm. So there, there, as I understand, or sorry. Chair Marty, uh, Senator Dames, excuse me. Um, as I understand it, there are two big challenges to getting green fertilizer online in Minnesota. Um, uh, and one is the um, large upfront capital cost. The second is, uh, is, is the long-term market for that. So this bill uh, solves for that upfront capital cost by helping cooperatives invest in green fertilizer uh, production. So, um, I, you know, I, I don't know that this investment from the state is factoring into that um, overall cost that the farmer will experience, but what it will do is attract that investment uh, here to Minnesota to make sure that we're building these facilities in Minnesota and that it's benefiting Minnesota producers. I hope that answered your question. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Well, Mr. Lurie, can you tell me, you know how many total dollars between this bill and the egg bill is being put into this green fertilizer as far as subsidies from the state? Chair, Chair Marty, uh, Senator Dames, my understanding is that uh, that, well, the first, there is none in the in the in the ag committee, okay. but there is um, the original 12 million and change uh, out of uh, Senator French's original proposal. This amendment would add nine million dollars. Our original request to the committee uh, was was 70 million dollars. For context, these uh, facilities are are hugely capital intensive, um, and and so. Um, this will help uh, in, in invest in those facilities and get more of them online. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. So can you tell me uh, what other states, are there other states doing this and doing it successfully that we're kind of following or pattering after? Or? So, uh, Senator Dames, uh, uh, Chair, Chair Marty, uh, we're really hoping to lead in this. The uh, University of Minnesota, through their um, uh, research facility in Morris, has been doing uh, work on uh, green fertilizer for two decades, as you well know, uh, through, through, through Mike Reese and others. And so we re really have been on the cutting edge of developing uh, this technology of creating um, ammonia through... Uh, using hydrogen produced through electrolysis. Um, what has changed and what's really made um, many more uh, folks interested in this is that hydrogen tax credit at the federal level, which will make this cost competitive. Um, we want to beat our neighboring states and other states into developing this industry. I'll also just to add, and I'd be eager to get this to you, but AURI just did uh, an, an independently completed uh, uh, a report looking at the, 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 the viability of these projects and came to a very similar conclusion, to the conclusion that the University of Minnesota came to, which is that this is going to happen. We want to make sure that it's next year in Minnesota and that it's supporting family farmers. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Senator Friends, there was a, I thought, a proposal several years ago for a place out in Renville County or Lacoparo. Is that, I thought, using wind power to, to generate anhydrous. Is that what, is this related to that? Was there a project built on that or? Mr. Chair, members, this comes primarily from the University of Minnesota presentation by Mr. Reese, and if there is a connection, I'm not familiar with okay. it. And i got to add, I'm, not on, I'm jealous of some of my colleagues here. I'm not on the Agriculture Committee for the first year in my time here in the Senate, so okay. I'm a little bit more disconnected from it. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I'm just I'm trying to get my... So we have uh, 
We have twelve million eight hundred ninety-two million in general fund money that's in the spreadsheet. This would take nine million or five million dollars out of the energy storage incentive grants, and then you set another four million out of the RDA. Um, I would ask members to vote no on this amendment, Senator Friends. I think it's a really cool project. Um, I'm struggling to find the connection back to the RDA. Just because we're using uh, renewable or green energy to produce fertilizer, I'm not sure that the, the ratepayers for Excel Energy ought to be picking up the tab for that. <coughs> Mr. Chair, Senator, Senator Pratt, allow me the opportunity to try to talk you out of your no vote. One of the purposes for the renewable development account is, and I quote part three, to stimulate other innovative energy projects that reduce demand and increase system efficiency and flexibility. So I would suggest to members that it qualifies as an RDA project. And Mr. Lorry, um, you know, is, is talking about a lot of features. One that he, I wouldn't say glossed over, but emphasizes um, farmers need predictable price inputs. And the predictability of this is a virtue for a lot of farmers. So A, Senator Pratt, I hope you'll reconsider because it qualifies. And B, I think the, the value of the innovation is that farmers can say, this is how much the fertilizer is going to cost every month. But with that, I would encourage members to vote yes on the amendment. Further discussion on the A32 amendment. If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion prevails. Thank you, members. Thank you, Mr. Lorry. Um, one final amendment. Uh, members, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A33 amendment. Um, do people have this, this one in their packets? I think cleaning up after the last, maybe we may have picked up some. We'll get more to hand out. Mr. Stanley assures me that it's up there somewhere. Does Those anybody have it words. in their I have a 33. A32. Senator Murphy has it. Some must. Just check. Most people need it. Raise your hand if you do not have one, please, so we can. Is everybody down here have it? That end seems to have Yeah, better put it. Senator Friends, I think people now have the A33 amendment. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Glad to see the full complement of the Finance Committee present. Members, the A33 amendment is worth talking about. This is what is the current agreement between the Prairie Island Nation and XL Energy that relates to the relicensing of the Prairie Island nuclear facility. Many of you may be familiar with the terms of the previous agreement wherein the Prairie Island community receives annual payments in exchange for the fact that they are the most proximate living community to nuclear waste in the country, only about 700 yards. Recently, you may have seen in the media announcement of a new agreement. Uh, the A33 roughly describes the Senate position on that new agreement, and Mr. Chair, uh, take a moment to go through this. First of all, in subdivision four, the settlement must provide for annual payments to the community of 2.5 million annually by the public utility, which is XL to the Prairie Land community. And that can be uh, paid for with rate recovery under the terms of part B. Rate recovery members, of course, means that XL rate payers um, would be uh, paying the, the settlement in exchange for whatever rate payer benefit there is to continuing to maintain the nuclear facility. In parts um, B also is the $50,000 for each dry cask. Uh, that is where the nuclear waste is stored. I would say so far so good on the storage, although that's an issue in itself. And so those payments are contained in part B. In addition to the other payments, Mr. Chair and members, in part C, the PUC is directed to allow rate pay recovery for $7.5 million. So under the present number of casks, about $12.5 million. Um, this Proposal is strongly endorsed in letter and spirit by XL Energy in the Prairie Line community. And those of you that serve on the Energy Committee may recall the testimony of uh, Prairie Island Community President Johnson and XL Energy CEO Chris Clark. I will say 
as Mr. Nauman knows, uh, the A33 differs slightly from the house position, and that is because we have taken a slightly different view of the use of renewable development account funds and ratepayer recovery. And while there's a midpoint between those two, um, that's the Senate position. And with that, members happy to answer questions, asking for your support for the A33 amendment. Questions from members of the committee, Senator Pratt. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. No question. I just want to thank Senator French for bringing this amendment. I had a chance to talk to Mr. Johnson yesterday, and it sounds like it was an, uh, an amicable negotiation, and I'm glad we have uh, an agreement. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator French, can you tell me how many acres this involves? For the dry storage or the for nuclear facility? For the land that's going to be transferred. Um, it's not a land transfer. They, the, the community has the purpose to purchase land, and they have in the amendment um, language that was struck in the A33, the original language before struck would have allowed them to acquire up to 1,500 acres. That language is struck by this amendment. What's basically going on is in exchange for this money, Perry Island community will support the relicensing, and uh, XL is seeking relicensing of the nuclear facility. Thank you. And, Senator Friends, where is the land, if it's not within, not contiguous, is it trade secret? <laughs> I'm just curious, is, is, I, is I there know. a piece of property envisioned, or we don't know? If there is, that was not brought to me as the terms of the deal. Um, as you can see, there was a limit of acres in the previous language that they struck. Um, I will say, Mr. Chair and members, to Senator Dames's question, part of the purpose of this in the original deal that's now winding up is that the Prairie Island community would be able to buy land to live on that was a little bit farther away from this stored nuclear waste. And um, to some extent, the money that they've received over the terms of this agreement has allowed them to do that. The thought is these funds would be potentially available to buy additional land. And obviously, they hope to grow the Prairie Island community, so they would need a few more houses. But the bulk of the agreement is that these dollar figures would be exchanged and XL ratepayers would get the benefit of the nuclear facility functioning for XL Energy hopes another 20 years. And Senator Dames. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And maybe somebody uh, up here could tell me what I'm referring to is on line 113 of the A33 amendment. The lands that may be conveyed are located in St. Louis County are described as, and it goes on from line 115 through line 119. Those are the lands I'm referring to, and it says may be conveyed. So that would be the land I'm curious how many acres this includes. We have representatives from XL here, maybe if there's. I believe I know what that refers to, Mr. Chair, but I'm going to have Mr. Stanley take a stab at it first. Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, I'm not entirely sure I'm following. The language that you all are discussing, that paragraph is existing law dealing with the previous settlement that was reached, uh, you know, when this issue came up earlier. And so the nothing about the new payments under this language is changing that arrangement other than to remove the language that Senator Friends pointed to on line 16 and 17. Mr. Chair. Senator Friends. Thank you, Senator Marty, and thank you, Senator Dames. I believe the language here refers to the original contest that the Prairie Island Nation raised to having the waste stored there in the first place in 1994. And so what the um, original language that Mr. Stanley is referring to is to say, this resolves outstanding disputes. And I believe what they're referring to is Prairie Island community did not agree in the first place that there should be nuclear plant, never mind nuclear waste, right by them. So these payments are in exchange for that to Thank resolve you. that dispute. Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman and Senator Dames, I think you might be looking at the A33 that's for the other Bill, there's, a, there's another A33 amendment out there that deals with the land exchange for St. Louis County. That is for the environment bill coming up. The A33 that Senator Dames is working on is for, it's dated 418, 1131 AM. 
and it's to Senate File 2847. You are correct, sir. Uh, Pat. Nice. Uh, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Senator. I hope that sharpened your minds. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank um, you, Mr. Chair. I don't have any other further comment. I had one other question on this one, and that is that I gather from the buying of land nearby the, the possible need to move or the desire to move or whatever. I wonder how that fits in with the net zero community the RDA has been funding for Prairie Island right now. We're not building something, leaving it behind. We are they're expanding the community and... Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, I believe their intention is to expand the land they have now so that some of their land would still be in net zero territory, but they are hoping to grow also. Okay. If there are any further questions, we have representative from the tribe and also XL here. But any further discussion on the A33 amendment? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Further discussion, further amendments? Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair Marty. I don't have an amendment. I just had some questions for the author. Um, so I'm um, just some explanation, if we could, briefly, because I don't serve on your committee. On Article 3, Section 1, the Homeowner Insurance Fortified Program Standards. Um, I believe it's on page 17 it starts yes and then if if you could maybe just go into the strengthening Minnesota home program too, just to just a real quick recap if you would go ahead mr. Senator. chair senator Dran so this is a program that aspires to strengthen homes against bad storms and in exchange will allow the insurance industry to provide a premium credit. Members, think about a driver who agrees to go accident-free for three years or carry a monitor. So Senator Draham, what they're doing here is the word fortifying. I don't know if that's different from strengthening, but the fortified program standards lists a number of definitions and says if your property is fortified, we'll help fortify it. And once it's fortified, we have the insurance industry ready to give you a break on your premiums, the theory being they will see a reduction in claims to offset those premiums. That's the basics. I don't know if that's enough for you. It's a, I, Sen yeah. Go ahead. Senator Dames. Uh, maybe I could help uh, on that one. What it amounts to is there are certain shingles and siding that are certified to be more storm resistant than some of the others are. So if a homeowner puts on these certified shingles or certified roof, then the state requires that the insurance company give a discount for doing that. And there's a process set up, and that was in the uh, uh, Commerce Bill for this section and how the process would work. That's what it is. Perfect. Thank you. And then on the Strengthening Minnesota Home Program? In Article 3, Senator Dram? Senator, yes, Article 3, Section 2. Um, Senator Draham, Mr. Chair, members, the Strength in Minnesota Homes program listed in Section 2 simply establishes the program in the Department of Commerce and then appropriates the money, if I'm understanding your question correctly, and lists some of the criteria for applicant eligibility and also contractor eligibility. Am I in the ballpark, Senator Draymond? You are. Thank you. And then on, uh, if I could, Mr. Chair, I just had a, two more things. Um, it looks like you're, you're uh, doing some of the same language we, we heard earlier today on the certifying building material in, in this bill. And then, um, let's see here, on, on Article 4. Section one would be the, the same language we heard earlier, crack, that's the exact same boilerplate that we had earlier. I believe so, Senator. And then the last question um, is, is section two. The lowest possible cost energy conservation. 
Mr. Um, Chair, Senator Dram, are you still in Article 4? I am on Article 4, yep, okay. on page 29, I believe. All right. Thank you, Senator. Article 4, vehicle purchases. The, uh, yeah, possible, I, I'm looking at sub, uh, section 2, um, lowest possible cost, energy conservation, uh, concerning both construction and operating cost for new buildings and major renovations. I do have that in front of me, Senator Drahan and Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. For section 2, are you saying to explain it? Well, yeah. yeah uh, on 29.18, it says establish resilience guidelines to encourage design that allows buildings to adapt um, climate-related changes. Um, so I'm just wondering, who, who's doing the uh, guidelines? Well, the program is, Mr. Chair, Senator Dram, the program is established within the Department of Commerce, so as, you know, I'm expecting them to evaluate. And also, you can see earlier... In the language, there's, um, I believe, a certification of evaluators. If you'll allow me to thumb backwards. <laughs> Senator, you're on page 28? 29. 29. At what line? Um, 29.18. Just trying to understand it, uh, Senator Frentz. Possibly 20, page 28, Senator? No. Uh, 29.18. 29.18, yes. I knew that. I was just testing. All right. You're looking at 2918 established resiliency guidelines? Yes, correct. All right, as part of the, the Department of Commerce program. This is by clean by fair is the, the name we know it by. Okay. And then your question is what's the who's the entity that will establish those guidelines? Correct. I thought it was the Department of Commerce. Okay. That's it. It's that simple. That's it. Just want to know. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dram. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Mueller, I was looking at the spreadsheet again. I was wondering if you could confirm if my analysis is right. Um, we are seeing a, a $4.4 million increase in the operating cost of the PUC at a 2.978 increase over forecast for the Department of Commerce, both um, operating expenses, listed as operating expenses, which would mean the PUC is getting a 26% increase and the Department of Commerce is getting a 42% increase in their operating budget? Um, Mr. Chairman, part of that is the, there's a few things rolled together, and that, especially with the PUC, a part of that 4.4, if you look on lines 11 through 15, um, these are the change items that all roll up together to the 4.4. The regular operating increase that was part of the governor's budget is actually about 3.3 million. And then those uh, uh, other additional amounts on lines 12, 13, 14, and 15 were all additional amounts that are going to PUC to help fund some of the additional <coughs> items in the bill. So just the, the yeah. base operating adjustment is $3.3 million for PUC. And then there's, um, based on a fiscal note, the changes made to the community solar gardens modifications um, would require $430,000 more. The dispute resolution <coughs> with utilities, another four hundred sixty-five. dollars Electrical vehicles rebate program that's in the bill, uh, Commerce, or PUC had a of money in a fiscal note for that, 128000 And then the compensation for PUC proceedings, which is also some policy in the bill, was sixty-four. So those items together have the $4.4 million increase. And then similar with um, Commerce, their change items, their operating adjustment is on line 62. Or let me see, 62... 
through 64. There's about 2.5, about $3 million of it that's just part of their operating adjustment. And then there also is a couple of adjustments to commerce for dealing with dispute resolution with utilities and the community solar gardens. But overall, if you combine it together, you're, you are correct that there's an operating adjustment of, I think your percentages are probably correct. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Mueller. So um, if let's just take the PUC, for example. Um, there's no forecast under those change items. So is that to say that we are seeing a, that other than the maintain current service levels in the 16,499 or the 16,628 in the forecast, that was all operating and everything else is additional? Mr. Chairman, Senator Pratt, um, I'll just reiterate that the line 11, the maintained current ser service levels of $3.3 .3 million is an increase based on the, the operating adjustment. Um, those other line items are based on policy changes in the bill that the PUC costed out as additional um, cost items. Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt, continue. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I'm concerned that we're still looking at a 20% increase in operating expenses at the agency when Dr. Kalamakitas has told us we should be looking at probably something closer to 4%. Um, even if we were to look, you know, go back and look over the last couple of years, we're still at probably closer to eight or nine percent total. And this seems to be um, an unusually high amount, or at least a, a usually high amount and an unusually high rate. I'm still trying to where when we look at the uh, Department of Commerce, I can see where Mr. Mueller is saying that, you know, there's basically a half a million dollars, or a half a billion dollars in, uh, I guess it would be a half a million, in true operating expense, um, which to me seems a lot more reasonable than a 20% increase for the PUC. Mr. Chair. Um, after reviewing the math carefully, I want to agree with Senator Pratt and then disagree a little. Uh, I agree with your math on the numbers. However, the PUC has seen escalating dockets year after year after year. They're not doing the same amount of work as they did 10 years ago. And some of the intervener compensation material relates to the fact that we got more and more people trying to jump into these dockets. So I believe part of what's being reflected is the anticipation of the PUC having to do more work. Senator Pratt, continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Senator Frentz, I would agree with you, except you've got a line item of 64000 for compensation for PUC proceedings, which I'm assuming is that intervener piece. Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, no, that is actually um, something from legal aid, which has to do with some dispute resolution, which is in the bill also. Uh, this is way in the weeds, but since you ask, um, up until the material in this bill should it pass, a uh, utility customer would have a limited number of ways to get dispute resolution. They would essentially be able to be told um, by the PUC staff that there's nothing we can do. That money is because now with language in the bill, it would be possible for a utility customer to elevate it all the way up and get an up or down decision. And this was a um, policy that had been in some bills that were introduced in the last couple bienniums. And um, legal aid's take is that the very least... Uh, wealthy Minnesotans need a way to get some of this resolved, and I was told we were one of the only states in the country that didn't have it. I think that's where that money comes from. Senator Pratt, continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. S Senator Frentz or Mr. Mueller, so I guess if I want to dig apart that maintain current service levels at a 20% increase, what would we expect? I mean, how much of that would we expect to be because of the intervener policy that's been that's been added to the bill? How much is to the um, increased caseload and how much are we just looking at in total uh, and, and just true inflationary cost because one of the reasons for adding inflation to the forecast was to make sure that we were breaking out inflationary costs versus some of the other other growth factors. 
Mr. Mueller. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Pratt, I'll just add sort of the term maintain current service levels is used in many of the budgets going across all, all the areas. It isn't necessarily just an operating increase. I think some agencies treated it differently, and I don't think there was a um, same policy applied to all agencies about what that line item meant. You know, some agencies may use that line item to have a, you know, five, seven percent increase or something like that. Other agencies, um, I would guess you say, could fold it other things, considerations into that line item. So I, in dealing with a number of agencies that I've dealt with across my budget area, there are different percentages that are applied, that are tied to that same change item. So I think you are correct. There's, it's a, some agencies maybe did absorb other costs other than just inflationary costs into that line item. But this was the line item, this is the same amount that was proposed in the governor's budget before any new policies were um, sort of baked into that line item. Senator Friend. Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, just briefly, an intervener comp is actually a different animal, which is um, parties choose to intervene in PUC proceedings if they are not successful or if they're deemed successful but not materially contributing to the result. They don't get any intervener comp. There is no cost. When there is intervener compensation, like the language in this bill contemplates, that's rate recovered, also no cost to the state. Senator Pratt, continue. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Senator Frentz, that that I guess because this is a general fund expense for maintaining current service levels, we wouldn't be including those intervener costs in maintaining current service levels. Senator Pratt, Mr. Chair, except for the fact that when they intervene and when there are more dockets in general, there's a larger amount of work anyway, but the intervener comp portion does not increase the cost of the state, whether it's successful or unsuccessful. I'm standing by my answer. Further discussion? Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Frentz, I'd like to offer the 834 amendment. It's my understanding this has been reviewed with you. Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, unbelievably yes, and I treat it as a friendly amendment, uh, and I want to thank the staff that obviously did quite a bit of work here in the last, what, five hours? Um, since it's Senator Pratt's amendment, I'll let him describe it, but I have had the 834 can, amendment in I my hands for about 20 minutes. And Mr. Chair and members, I do consider this a friendly amendment as best I can understand it given the time involved. Mr. Mr. Friends, you're getting quieter as we go through the evening. If you can move your mic a little bit closer. I sure but, can, Mr. Chair, and I believe Mr. Mueller can describe it too. Thank you. And Mr. Mueller, go ahead and explain the A34. Um, Mr. Chairman and members, the A34 amendment does a couple of things. The, the main part of it is it provides a, a $300 $32,000 grant um, to the Lake of the Woods County to demolish an abandoned uh, school. Um, this comes from the general fund, and we have already met our target, so the lines above it do a couple of things to sort of free up 322000 As you'll remember, when I first went through the spreadsheet, we were below target in the tails by $322,000. So we have moved some spending from fiscal year 25 over to 26. And that frees up $322,000 that allows for the payment of a grant that will go out through the Department of Administration, which is already in the bill for this. Um, this is a proposal that would um, it's help, and maybe Senator Pratt can help explain that the spending part of the of the proposal on lines 1.6 to 112. But as far as the mechanisms of freeing up $322,000, it reduces one of the appropriations in the bill by 322, and then sort of moves that off into the tails. Um, this amendment keeps us on target, and it no we are no longer below target in the tails, but we are right on target in the tails. Senator Pratt, on your amendment, just out of curiosity, I'm not objecting to it. I'm not familiar with the state-owned Williams School. And um, 
and it says to remediate petroleum pollutants or contaminants at the school site. How did you pick this bill for it? <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would have to say that I did not pick this bill for it. I, I think we've been working um, with Senator Herr, Senator Friends, uh, Senator Green, and Senator Aki to try to, to try to figure out how to get this state-owned building demolished with an old uh, heating oil uh, tank underground, some spoiled soils, some uh, some asbestos and lead, um, and that's that's basically it. I think we 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 were originally looking at it for Senator Herb's bill, but we came to an agreement on this bill. Good explanation. Um, is there further? Is there a discussion on the A34 amendment? Senator Friends, if not, um, Senator Pratt moves the A34 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. <laughs> Further discussion on the bill? If not, Senator. Friends moves to lay Senate file 2847 as amended on the table. Mr. Chair, if I could, um, just a brief word of thanks to nonpartisan staff, Mr. Mueller, Mr. Stanley, to our researcher, um, to GOP research, Mr. Frazier, to the members of the committee, needless to say, to my committee legislative assistant, Travis Ernest, and my outstanding committee administrator, Justin Emmerich. Um, we work together on a lot of different things. It's amazing, Senator Pratt, that we ended on that amendment because we have tried to be bipartisan. And I forgot to mention this for Senator Matthews, so please allow me this, Mr. Chair. We have the advanced nuclear study. It's one of Senator Matthews' priorities in the bill. And with that, I appreciate very much the opportunity to present this to you, Mr. Chair, and look forward to um, combining it and moving it on out of here. Thank you. And now with um, Senator Pratt's amendment, you bet the targets exactly. I mean, um, is there any further discussion on the motion to lay this bill over, lay it on the table as amended? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. That leaves us the opportunity at 8.03 p.m. for Senator Herr. Members want to take a three or four minute break? You're fine. What? <laughs> Senator Herr, welcome to the Senate Finance Committee again for the Omnibus Environment and Climate Appropriations Bill. Um, House File 2310, I believe. Well, yes, we have, and we have the language in the form of... Um, 2438. 2438, yes. So you'll be presenting that. Go ahead and um, give your introduction, and we'll turn to your two Chair. staff. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Marty and members. Uh, before I proceed with the introduction, I have an author amendment, the 830 amendment. And the 830 amendment is mainly to technical language, and later, if need to, uh, have explained by uh, Mr. Stanley. Uh, I, wish, I certainly allow that. Chair. I go ahead, Senator Herb. Okay. If if you don't mind, I'd like to have uh, Ms. Mr. Mueller walk through the amendment first. 
Okay. The before a my introduction. Four, a, wait. It's an A30. Mr. Chair. Yes. I don't have the A30. I think we're struggling to find it. 24. It's one with a time stamp, 840 p.m. It may have been, it should have been in the packets, in the paper clip behind the thing, but I, how many people, if we have a lot of people who don't have it, we may need to. Nope, that's, wait, nope, that's a different amendment. Do do people have the a? It's yeah for twenty four thirty. Okay. No, I do. A number of people not have the a thirty amendment. Yes. Let <laughs> <laughs> let's pause for a minute to get the I amendments. We're going to get copies of it. I have the a thirty from the last bill. We need a better coding system than multiple A30s. Well, once we get them, once we get them done, I, I do. Yes. Me, Chair Martin. While Chair we Martin. while we try and group yeah. here, we're going to make sure we do have A30 printed up. Okay. Chair Marty. You can. Senator Her, um, I Perhaps I think just, we will have everybody will have a copy. I'll of just give introduction to the bill yeah, first. They're, they're handing it out now. Oh, I think they got it now. <laughs> I think. A30 amendment. Uh, Mr. Mueller, you want to go ahead and explain sure. it now that people um, have it? Sure, Mr. Chairman. The A30 amendment is the author's amendment that basically conforms um, some of the language in the bill, uh, makes sure it matches up with the spreadsheet and um, conforms with our target. Lines 1.2 all the way to 1.24 sort of clarify some of the, the uh, base amounts, and especially going off into the uh, tails. There are a number of areas where we have one-time money I'm going to the agency, and we wanted to make sure the tails are set um, at, at making sure the, the one-time money is one time. Um, so that's the language mostly on lines 1.2 all the way down to 1.24. Lines 1.25 through 1.31 adjust one of the appropriations in the DNR. Um, later on in the, in the bill and when we go through, when, when I go through the the spreadsheet, we'll be talking about some changes to the lottery in lieu and how much goes to the general fund and how much goes to the uh, different lottery in lieu accounts. In recalculating that with the February forecast, there was a $19,000 change that we had to make to meet our target. So what lines 126 to 131 um, do, does is adjusting the DNR appropriation by $19,000 in fiscal year 24 and 44,000 in fiscal year 25 and later and then replaces that general fund amount with a uh, appropriation from the heritage enhancement account so it keeps DNR whole it just switches money from one fund from the general fund to a different fund um, on the page two of the amendment there are a couple riders in the bill and, and within DNR that need to be corrected um, that conform to the spreadsheet and um, since the bill did not have fee increases we had to make sh clean up some of the riders to um, make sure they weren't contained increases due to fees so that's on line 2.1 to 2.3 um, lines 2.4 through 2.6 there was a number of appropriations in the bill that were originally available till 2029 and this changes them to 2027 and then lines 2.7 to 2.12, there's a provision in the bill requiring voter safety um, um, certification for some uh, people. And this exempts resorts from that voter safety provision. 
So that's on lines 2.7 to 2.12. And then the last change on line 2.13 and 14 corrects the spelling error. So that is the the I figured out the last line myself. Yes. That um, is the A30 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mueller. Senator Wicklin moves the A30 amendment. Is there further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. You ready for the walkthrough? You have other amendments first. Um, I'll just I'll give a little introduction, a little overview of this bill, uh, and thank you, Chair Marty and members. Uh, before you is the Senate File 2438 as amended, and this is the Senate Omnibus uh, Environmental Bill. Um, this bill fully funds our agency, which allows them to do an important and much needed work to keep our air, water, soil, and land clean and healthy for all Minnesotans. This is a bipartisan bill. It includes several provisions, chief author by our GOP member, as well as uh, regional representation. This is a fiscal responsible bill. There's no, no, there's no fee increase in this bill. Article 1 con contains the environmental budget appropriation. Article 2 includes environmental policy changes that have fiscal impact to our state. And Article 3 is a DR land bill that includes private and public sale of surplus land in Aiken, Backer, Crow Wing, uh, Candy Yohi, uh, Kukaching, and uh, St. Louis and Sherburn counties. Okay. I'd like to highlight a few important pieces in this legislation, including bills in particular, uh, Senator Champion's cumulative impact bill, Senator Morrison bill to address chronic wasting disease, and Senator Seberger's bill to ban PFAS in certain products. While all these bills were somewhat controversial in their introduction, the author had worked with many of the stakeholders to get the bill to a more workable plan. Cumulative impacts, for example, the cumulative impact bill has been scaled back significantly. It's now limited to seven county metro area, and the wastewater treatment facility are exempted. Uh, CWD, Senator Morrison's um, bill, in conjunction with Senator Putnam and I, uh, have several conversations with the Board of Animal Health and the DR and have made many changes request by the agency and other stakeholders who have weighed in. While I'm proud of this bill, um, there are a lot, uh, I do wish uh, we could have done more, and there are a lot of important pieces of legislation that we were not able to include in this bill. I hope we can continue to have conversation about these ideas, especially policy, uh, propose, po policy proposal uh, for the next session. So I urge members to support this bill, and I'll turn over to our counsel, um, Mr. Mueller, and then Mr. Stanley. Mr. Mueller will talk about the fiscal uh, side of this bill. Mr. Mueller, welcome back. <laughs> Please go ahead and start with the spreadsheet. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members, I have a, there should be a, hopefully a spreadsheet in your packet. It's titled, um, there's a cover sheet. It's titled Senate File 2438, First Engrossment, Environment and Climate Budget. The cover page just is sort of a general fund summary by agency, and it shows the, this uh, bill has a general fund target above the 24-25 forecast of $670 million. Largely that is one-time money. The target in the tails is $90 million. Um, on this cover page, you can look at um, column H is the amount of new money above the forecast, f just for the general fund. So you'll see with Pollution Control Agency, it's about $303 million of general fund money. And you'll see over on line, or on column O, there's only $1.7 in the tails. So the, the PUCs, or in our 
PCA's uh, general fund increase is almost all one time. Department of Natural Resources on line seven is a $234 million general fund increase. And you'll see in the tails, 72 million of that is ongoing. Then we'll jump down to Met Council Regional Parks, 17.5 million general fund, and that is all one time. Next, we go down to Board of Water and Soil Resources, $87.184 million, and only one million of that is ongoing. The Minnesota Zoo, $3.85 million general fund increase, and three million is ongoing. Um, the Science Museum, that is mostly just an operating adjustment, $302,000 and 362 in the tails. <coughs> and then there's a one-time transfer to the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Landfill Contingency Action Account of $12 million. That is paying off, uh, returning some money that was uh, transferred out of that account a number of years ago and was never totally paid back. And Mr. So Mueller, is that the total then, this $12 million? That's, that's completed then? Um, Mr. Chairman, um, depending on how you look at it, that some, this is not the total amount that was in the bill. Um, the bill assumed interest payments over the years that were not accrued okay. at the time. This mostly just paid back the amount that was taken out, but not necessarily all not the interest. Not the interest, the earnings on it. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Senator Pep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mueller. Um, could you explain H again? Why does it say for Senate, is that Senate minus forecast? Yes. Is that basically the change yes. column? Okay, it's just a, I didn't quite understand okay. what that meant. Yes. Thank um, you. Mr. Chairman, Senator Pappas, yeah, that is the amount of new spending above the forecast. Um, and then I'll also note that, so there's $658 million in new expenditures. There's also a change in the bill that I'll go over quick when we get to the spreadsheet in detail that changes the amount of lottery and lieu revenue that goes to the general fund. Currently 72% of the money goes, or roughly about 38% of it goes to the general fund. This decreases that to 15%. So there's a general fund revenue loss of $11.6 million. And then there's some fiscal year 23 expenditures and cancellation, that's another $210,000. That gets us to our target of $670 million, you'll see on line 20. And then again, the tails is $90 million. So this is just a summary of the general fund changes by agency. If we flip over to the next page, I'll start to go through the change items. Um, first, we have the Pollution Control Agency. They are, the way the spreadsheet works, we'll be working off the Senate columns and the change items start on line 16. The lines above it, lines seven through 13, is the base amount, the total base amount for the, for the agency. So the agency base amount is $547 million. And right now, only about 13 million of that comes from the general fund for Pollution Control Agency. The other two major funds are Environmental Fund, which is about $180 million and the remediation fund, which is $258 million. But with this bill, it is largely general fund money that are being, is being added to it just because it's one time. And you'll see that uh, as I go through the change items, um, the Senate 204, 205, or 2024, 2025 is the next biennium. And then the next Senate columns over, you'll see where there's a lot of blanks. That's the tails. So there's only a few, items that have ongoing general fund money. Line 16 is to maintain current service levels. The general fund amount, that's 1.5 million, and then 1.7 in the tails. That is the only general fund item in, for PCA that has uh, tails. Um, climate, climate pathways, line 17, that was a governor's item, 500,000. Line 18 is the major initiative here that was in the governor's budget. This is resilient communities and water infrastructure. This is a grant program that goes out to locals to help them uh, deal with water issues in the community, like with wastewater and stormwater. And that amount is one time $173.88 uh, million. Mr. Chairman. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. Mueller. 
That money doesn't go through the P um, Public Facilities Authority? Mr. Chair and Senator Pappas, no, this goes through PCA. PCA. There is a separate program through PFA, but this is just PCA's program, and it's more tied to the types of projects that don't get funded through the PFA, okay. more like community um, storage water and sto um, water storage systems and things like that, and wastewater, not wastewater, but um, stormwater systems storm and things okay. like that. So that's, all right, just want to make sure that we're not doing redundancies. Right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, continuing on, so of that, on line 19 is the amount that goes out in grants. So it's about $81 million in 24 and $86 million in 25. And again, there's no tails. There are two separate um, set aside projects. There's a $5 million for the St. Louis County landfill dealing with a PFAS runoff. And then um, city of uh, uh, Fergus Falls water project, uh, $75,000. There's a one-time general fund request for water programs for $2 million. Um, industrial air reduction grant of $800,000. Uh, grants to environmental justice areas, $5.6 million. Uh, air compliance maintenance, $80,000. $80, um, innovative solutions for man managing pollutants, $600,000. Um, taconite industry grants, um, 16.7 million. And then of that amount, there's a $900,000. In addition to that is $900,000 to the national uh, NRRI. Um, or 2.1 million, excuse me, 2.1 million of that on line 29 was to NRRI. Um, technical assistance uh, for tribal governments, $4 million one time. The next um, is $30 million uh, to agency environmental IT upgrades. That was a $35 million request in the governor's budget, and this is funded at 30. Um, drink of water protection and PFAS, uh, $25 million. These are grants out to local facilities or communities dealing with um, drinking water or PFAS and drinking water issues. Um, climate. Environmental review staff, 320,000. Small business environmental, for small business improvement fund, uh, 1.86 million. The solar energy end of life uh, study of what to do with the, some of the solar um, materials at the end of their life, 420,000. Update capital assistance program, 17,000. Uh, another PFAS uh, dealing with uh, Resource reduction grants and staffing, $4.4 million. Um, the Senate has a PFAS firefighter gear report, $500,000. Um, there's a, a dealing with fish kills and the protocol for how the communities are notified about fish kills, $393,000. Um, microplastics report, $500,000. And then there's waste production and grants and loans, 27.8 million. Um, Green Step Cities is a governor's proposal for 380,000. Then there's a county feedlot program increase, $2 million. And then a, for the Environmental Quality Board, 760,000. So a total general fund increase of 303 million dollars and again only 1.7 million dollars in the tails there's also changes from the environmental fund starting on line 51 since this is the fund that largely covers the operating parts of the pca you'll see their maintained current service levels uh, increase here is 12.7 million in 24 25 and then 15.2 million in the tails an air appropriation increase is 1.497 million. This is one area of the bill that does have a fee increase. Um, the federal statutes require the state to increase their some of their air fees for inflationary um, adjustments. Um, so this reflects that, and then it is also appropriated out. Um, increased biomonitoring. Um, money that's transferred over to the Department of Health on line 53, that's $800,000. Uh, 
uh, cumulative impacts proposal is 915,000 and then 400 in the tails. Again, this is all out of the environmental fund. Uh, technical staffing for PFAS. Uh, the governor had $4.1 million for this. The Senate has 1.8, and the Senate used part of that appropriation to pay for some of the other PFAS changes that are in this bill. Increasing data, data management staffing, 2.6 million, and that's ongoing. Next page, um, these are all, all from the Environmental Fund. Industrial stormwater program staff, 700,000. Hazardous waste and solid waste staff, 420,000. County subsurface treatment system program increase, 442,000. Emergency readiness response staffing increase, 420. And environmental workforce innovation, there's a couple of uh, carve out. There's one carve out in there for environmental pathways for students at 270,000. Solid waste permitting staff, 1.2 million. Minnesota Green Courts is 1.3 million. An increase to score grants. Um, this is a part of the Senate proposal to increase score grants by $2 million per year ongoing. These are grants that go out to counties to help pay for their waste reduction programs and recycling programs. And then the last item from the Environmental Fund is $150,000 for lead and cadmium in children's products. The other fund changes on line 78 through 42. Um, the first two items are other funds that PCA has and that are tied to the maintained current service levels. So $8 million from the remediation fund and $25,000 from the state government special revenue fund. Contam contaminated site management, this was a governor's proposal for $2.8 million. Um, uniform tools. Brownfields, these are all items that were in the governor's budget. And I'll note line 82 is a chloride, is a salt training um, program. This is the other item that actually has a fee in the bill, but it's a voluntary program for those that take the salt training, salt applicator training program at the PCA and are certified through it. It's, a non, it's not a mandatory program, um, but if you take it, they do collect a fee. And that this $400,000 uh, reflects that fee that is collected and then spent again on the program. So on line 87 is the total increase to the PCA is $348.6 million. And of that, on line 88, 303 million of it is from the general fund. After that, we'll, it shows the PCA revenue changes. Um, then the ones I'll note here, some are just transfers between funds, but the, the air appropriation increase on line 91 is $1.5 million, and then that chloride training fee is $800,000. The items below that, lines 94 through 99, are mostly just transfers between funds um, that are proposed in the governor's budget that deal with moving money between the uh, Environmental fund and the remediation fund that's on line 98 through 99. That's a transfer that um, happens annually. And the increase the petrol cleanup fund to the remediation fund, that is due to some of the operation or the, the maintain current service level changes in the bill. Next, I'll go to the DNR. On lines 107 through 113 is their base level of funding, which is about $1 billion. The general fund portion of that is $259 million. And then you'll see other, there are other sources of funding that are part of their base budget. Um, Natural Resources Fund is 235.6. The Game and Fish Fund, 250. Um, Special Revenue Fund, 106 million. And then other funds and Federal funds are about the last $200 million of their base budget. <clears throat> Page three starts the change items for the DNR. Again, there are a number of them with the general fund, and most of these are one time other than the operating increase. On lines 117 and 118 are the maintained current service levels or the operating increase for DNR. 
that is a $49 million in, and then there's additional 5.4 million of general fund money that's going to the Fish and Wildlife uh, Division. Um, the Senate has an additional, this additional amount on line 118, um, mostly because the Senate did not have an increase in the fishing license and according, the governor's budget was using some increase of revenue due to the fishing license increase to do some of the operating increase. And the Senate replaces that with general fund. So that amount is ongoing on lines 117 and 118. Um, most of the rest of the items here are one time, increasing mining regula regulatory capacity, 1.2 million. Uh, broadband utility licensing, 1.8 million. This is due to some of the um, new broadband um, initiatives that have come through with the federal government and state money. And some of these uh, broadbands go across state lands and they need, uh, DNR has requested additional money to help uh, speed up that process. Um, line 121 is $5.388 million for transfer of the Upper Sioux Agency State Park. Um, line one, 123 is $800,000 for protecting and managing water resources. That's one time. Um, protecting peatlands or protect and restore carbon storage on peatlands, $1.56 million. Uh, Red River Mediation Agreement, this is $36,000, additional one-time money for that. Uh, line 126 was a Senate item for a 50-year clean water plan. Um, line 127, um, $395,000 for invasive carp removal and surveys. And also line 128, $325,000 for invasive carp study. Um, line 129 is a cancellation um, of an aquatic invasive species and then a reappropriation. This uh, is a, would otherwise cancel and this reappropriates it. Also jump back up to number 122. There is also a $1 million appropriation in fiscal year 23 for the drill core library due to some safety issues there. Um, line 130, $3 million for reforestation on state managed lands. Line 131, private forest landowner technical assistance, $4.1 million. Uh, accelerated tree seed collection, $800,000. Um, line 133 is one of the major initiatives from the DNR. It's the Minnesota Relief Program, and this helps um, communities dealing with emerald ash borer plant new trees. And that's $17 million. Um, $2 million one time to help deal with estate trail maintenance. Um, chronic wasting disease increase, uh, $1.4 million on line 135. This, that's one time. Um, grasslands and wetlands for carbon capture, uh, $5.1 million. The governor had a $10 million request for this. Um, the CWD con contingency plan, this is deal also deals with chronic wasting disease, uh, $1.6 million. This is actually a grant to the Prion Research Center. Um, no Child Left Inside, uh, $1 million one time. And this is a program that targets uh, outdoor activities for youth. Um, aviation modernization, a $3 million. This will uh, help with the DNR's uh, aviation program, um, and some new equipment, and, and maybe even a new uh, aircraft. Public safety preparedness, 720000 um, Customer payment and IT upgrades, a little over $3 million for that. Um, the next item is the other ongoing item um, in the DNR, it's additional payments to the 1854 treaty recipients. Currently, they get a open, there's an open appropriation that goes out to the tribes that were part of the 1854 treaty agreement. And this would provide an additional $3 million to what was an open appropriation. And this tries to adjust some, uh, inf there was never inflation built into those treaty payments. So this um, addresses that um, amount. Um, illegal cost reappropriation on line 143, that just cancels an amount that was available in 23. 
and reappropriates it. Um, the next items are the DNR's Get Out More initiatives, and this is a, a number of one-time pots of money that are going out to address some of the DNR um, facilities and other uh, uh, issues. Line 145 is $28 million for uh, improved access of public lands and outdoor facilities. There are two set-asides within that, um, $400,000 for Silver Bay Trailhead and $500,000 for the Redhead Mountain Bike Park. Um, there's on line 148, $5 million for modernizing the campgrounds and related infrastructures. Line 149, $35 million for modernizing boat access. And there's again a carve out of that, or a set aside of that of $1.9 million dealing with the Crane Lake campground and boat access. Line 151 is modernizing fish hatcheries and infrastructure of $35 million. And then Line 152 is restoring streams and other water infrastructure of $15 million. So those items there were sort of the, the, the DNR's major use of the one-time money and where they directed that. So the DNR total of general fund increases is $234 million. And then in the tails, that's $72 million, and that is mostly for the operating increase and then the additional payment to the 1854 treaty um, recipients. Natural resources fund changes. Um, the governor had additional money on lines. You'll see on lines 157 through 161. These were largely tied in the governor's budget. You'll see on the governor's columns were tied to um, watercraft. The governor had a fee increase for uh, watercraft, uh, fishing, and parks. So a lot of those increases that were due to those fee increases are not in the Senate um, line items. So line 157 is the operating increase that comes out of the Natural Resources Fund. And then jumping down to line 162 and 163 is some money out of the ATV account for two different trails in St. Louis County. There's also money out of the ATV account on line 164. $500,000 for Northwoods ATV trails. Lines 165 and 166, these are two new accounts that are created in the lottery, lottery in lieu program that is in the bill. Um, now 2% of, of the lottery in lieu money that used to go to the general fund will now go to Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails. So they'll get an ongoing amount of starting in 500,000 the first year and then 750 ongoing. And there's also a new account in the lottery in lieu area of 1% of that money that used to go to the general fund now is reserved for outdoor rec recreation for underserved youth. And that is, will receive 300,000 the first year and then 350,000 ongoing. Um, jumping to the next page, so the total natural resources fund changes were 14.6 million, and you'll see that's a lot lower, that's about 20 million less than what the governor had. Um, that's due to not, not having the fee increases in this bill. Again, on the, we'll jump to game and fish fund changes. The governor had, under maintain current service levels, $25.7 million. And the Senate's only at about 15.9 million. And this is due largely to, this is where the Senate put additional general fund revenue to help offset that cost of the current service levels that otherwise would have come from the Game and Fish Fund. Uh, no Child Left Inside, there was a million dollars of general fund money and there's also a million dollars coming from the Heritage Enhancement Account. The walk-in access program is $800,000. Uh, a neonicotinoid study at $943,000 out of the Game and Fish Fund. A rough fish report, $268,000 out of the Game and Fish Fund. And then shooting sports facility grants, $600,000. This is a program that has been funded previously in other bienniums with one-time money out of the Heritage Enhancement Account which is in the Game and Fish Fund. 
So the total changes from the Game and Fish Fund is 19.5 million. That's on line 184. Other fund, there's a couple other funds that um, help pay for the maintain current service levels. The RIM account, reinvest in Minnesota. So that's 300,000 on that on line 187. And then the public uh, permanent school fund on line 188, $57,000. So the total changes to DNR on line 194 are $268.7 million. Line 195 shows that 234 million of that was from the general fund. Don't worry. The rest of this page show all the fee changes within the DNR. You'll see a lot of blanks on the Senate column. Um, these are all the fee changes that were proposed by the governor and the, they are not in the Senate bill. You'll see those on the, the governor's columns. There's uh, the lands bill has $572,000 um, worth of revenue due to article three in the bill that has the lands bill. So it's $572,000 from that provision, some, from some of the provisions in that article go into the land acquisition account. Um, a couple of Senate items are on line 215. There are changes in the bill that allow non-resident military people who are serving in the state and allows their spouse to also buy a, not, a resident license instead of a non-resident license. That has a slight um, decrease of revenue to the Cayman Fish Fund. There are some changes dealing with turtle harvesting in the bill and that also affects the licensing of turtle harvesting. So that's a low, that reduces the Game and Fish Fund by $5,000 per year. Um, I mentioned before in the technical amendment, there is a program in the bill dealing with water safety certification. Um, lines 217 to 218 transfer $58,000 from uh, the water rec account over to driver services account over at um, public safety. This would allow for them to put on your driver's license that you are certified to operate, that you've taken the boat safety course. The lottery and lieu changes are on line 219 through 225. So this is the amount that I mentioned before. Cur currently about 70 or about 28% of the lottery and lieu money goes to the general fund. The changes here would reduce that, or now only about 15% of the money goes to the general fund. So we're tracking a general fund loss of revenue of about $11.6 million in 24 25 and then 11.8. And that amount gets added to some of the additional lottery and lieu accounts you'll see on lines 220 through 225. The new account. I'll mention is the Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails account that was not part of the, one of the original lottery and lieu accounts. So they'll be getting about 900,000 a year going into that account and that will need to be appropriated each year by the legislature. And then the other new account is of the first line on line, page five is the outdoors for underserved account. And that will be getting about 470,000 per year ongoing. Um, lines 227 through 231, um, this is additional money that comes into the Game and Fish Fund from the federal Pittman-Robertson um, program. The way this works is whenever the, the state spends some additional money that qualifies, we basically get 75% in return. So a lot of the money that is spent, some of the money that's spent out of the Game and Fish Fund, the federal government reimburses us based on Pitt, it's Pittman and Robertson. These are monies collected based on uh, federal excise tax on guns and ammunition. So the DNR has actually figured out some ways to get some, to collect some more reimbursement for that. And so some of that is reflected here and some of that is reflected based on additional spending that qualify for the reimbursement. Next, we'll go to Met Council Regional Parks. Um, the change items here are all one time, or the general fund change items here are one time. Line 248, $5 million uh, 
increase park maintenance. Line 249, $10 million of modernizing regional parks and trails, and $2.5 million for uh, mapping infrastructure and climate risk. And then based on the lottery and lieu changes that occurred um, otherwise in the bill, uh, it increases the Metro Parks lottery and lieu appropriation by $1 million per year. They were currently getting about $7.4 million per year from the lottery and lieu, so this increases that by <coughs> excuse me, $1 million. So the total increase from Metro Met Council Parks on line 255 is 19.5 million. And then if you go over in the tails, only 2 million of that is ongoing. And that was from the lottery in lieu. Just a couple more agencies here, the Minnesota Conservation Corps. Um, there's no change to their base budget. So it's $1.8 million. Part of that is general fund. About half of that is general fund. And half of that is from the natural resources fund. But there's no change to their budget. The Board of Water Soil Resources, their base funding is $46.6 million, and about 30.5 30 million of that was is base funding from the general fund. Um, lines 280 start their change items. These are largely also one time due to the target. Um, line 280 is their maintained current service levels. That's about 5 559,700. 40,000 ongoing. The rest of the items, um, other than one item, are all one time. Line 281 is $26.7 million for accelerated soil health practices. Line 282, um, water storage and treatment, $17 million. These are all mostly grant programs that go out to local government. I'll note that. Um, Line 284 is the Lawns to Lagoons program, $4 million. Habitat Friendly Utilities program, $1 million. Habitat Landscape program, $4 million. Um, grasslands and Working Lands easements, $16 million. Um, private peatlands for carbon sequestration, $15 million. Um, next page, uh, also note the governor had $7 million for um, rim easements paid for the general fund. The Senate budget does not include that. Line 290, um, this is one item with another ongoing item. Uh, this designates one FTE for a tribal liaison. So that amount is ongoing, um, 265000 in 24 25 and 288000 in the tails. And then the Area 2 rim, River Basin Project will receive an additional $50,000 for just two years. And then the Natural Resources Block Grants, this is a, a one-time increase of $1.25 million per year just for the two years. So the Bowser total increase is $87.1 million, and that is all general fund increase. And most of that is almost all one time. The last two items here in Minnesota Zoo... Their base funding is $62.66 million. About a third of that, $20 million, is from the general fund. Um, you'll see on line 305, the amount that is collected from the special revenue fund, that is their gate receipts and admission receipts. Um, so the one, so the Minnesota Zoo is, has a $3 million op, sort of a maintain current service levels increase, and that is ongoing, and also has an $850,000 one-time amount for public safety and security systems. So that is a total of $3.85 million increase and $3 million ongoing. The last item here is the Science Museum, and that is a $302,000 maintain current ser service levels increase, and that is ongoing. And then the last general fund item that I mentioned when I did the overview is the transfer to MELCAT, or M Metropolitan Landfill Contingency Action Account, on line 335, $12, mil $12 million. That's an addition, one time addition to that. There's still an ongoing payment of 100,000 per year that goes into that. 
Um, so that is pretty much it for the change items. And I already went over how that met the target when I did the first page. So I think that ends it for the spreadsheet. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Stanley to point out a couple items in Article 2. Mr. Stanley, welcome back. And Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Good evening again. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, here again, there is a summary of the entire policy article in your packets. That's Article 2. I'm not going to go through all of that. I'm just going to hit on a few salient items in that article. And the first thing I'll mention is that sections 1 through 10, beginning on page 48, uh, and carrying you through page 53, contain the farm survey day provisions. And one of those that I'll mention, section 3, begins on page 49, line 20. This prohibits the registration of new white-tailed deer farms uh, after the effective date of the section and allows a transfer of an existing registration only once. I'll next draw your attention to sections 48 through 52 on page 86 through 91. These are some governor's modifications to the statutes that govern the capital assistance program. Uh, that program helps local governments pay for and expand their solid waste and materials management infrastructure. The changes generally would increase the maximum grant award amount under the program and expand the types of eligible projects. The next language I'll draw your attention to is the cumulative impacts language that begins Excuse on me. page 93. Could I ask a question, Mr. Chairman? Right, Senator Pappas. Uh, the capital assistance program, you said, uh, I think the grants were $2 million and they're going to $6 million or something. Is that correct? Let me find that. There's a certain amount of overlap here with uh, um, capital investment. The grants, the, the thing that I think you're asking about, Senator Pappas, mm -hmm. is on page 89, line 28, where it's going from 2 to 5. 2 to 5. Okay, thank you. Continuing, Mr. Chair, on sections 55 and 56, uh, these begin on page 93. This is the cumulative impacts language. Um, and I'll just highlight a few things about that. The language as it exists in the bill before you applies in a particular geographic area of the state. Uh, it would apply in the seven county metro area, except if a person were operating under a mining permit as well as in Indian country, which is a federally statutorily defined term, uh, except if a person is operating under a mining permit or if the proposed construction or expansion is located in the taconite assistance area. The types of permits the requirements would apply to, there's four of them, major source air permits, waste combustor permits, large solid waste disposal facility permits, and hazardous waste facility permits. The next provisions I'll point you to, section 57 on page 99. This requires manufacturers of products containing PFAS to submit information about the products to the PCA. And then on page 103, you'll notice that there is a prohibition on the sale of certain products containing PFAS that takes effect on January 1st of 2025. This language also allows the PCA to ban additional, to the sale of additional products containing PFAS between 2025 and 2032. So if it's not listed, PCA can by rule add it to the list essentially uh, through 2032. And then once 2032 arrives, the sale of non-exempt products containing PFAS is prohibited unless, as I said, there's an exemption or unless PCA by rule uh, finds that the inclusion of the PFAS in the product is a currently unavoidable use. The next change, Mr. Chair, is in section 59, page 105, line 6. Um, you'll see that this is the lottery and loot change that Mr. Mueller talked about. Um, increasing from 72.43% to 82% the portion of lottery and loo revenue that has to be used for natural resource purposes. And then on page 107, line 6 through 17, here's the language creating the two new set-asides of 2% uh, for the regional parks and trails account and 1% 
for the new outdoor recreational opportunities for underserved community accounts. Mr. Mueller talked about these. Uh, section 61 through 63 on pages 109 through 111, Mr. Chair, these prohibit the use of Class B firefighting foam containing PFAS, and there are several exceptions for uses required by federal law, uh, uses at airports, and there's a temporary exemption for uh, oil refineries. And the final provision I'll draw your attention to is section 68 at the bottom of page 115. This language transfers administration and oversight of farmed white-tailed white deer from the Board of Animal Health to the DNR effective July 1, 2025. Thank you, Mr. Stanley. Discuss questions from the committee first. Senator Draheim and Pappas. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I, I do have an amendment. Would now be an appropriate time, or I guess so. Thank you, Senator Heard. You have some other amendments you wanted to deal with, or yeah, as, as, from what I all the, I only have one technical amendment that's already amended to the bill, but there are. From what I gather, there's other four amendments, uh, but uh, it has okay, to well, be. We'll just go ahead with be, Senator Draheim yeah. to get to them, whatever order. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have the A35 amendment, and, and I'm hoping the author will take this as a, a friendly amendment. If you tell me where to look, to look. Sorry. It may be in packets, but it's being distributed. Mr. Chair, Graham, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Senator. Her, I, I believe this was in the original bill um, for this section. Uh, it had, I think, three lakes in it, and. Um, I, I was able to witness uh, this process, I guess, in, uh, I'll call it a pond, compared to my lake, um, probably three, four miles from my house, real close. Um, and I know they've been uh, jumping around the state doing different projects. It looks very promising. And, you know, my kind of internal debate is, Okay, now we've done it on smaller bodies of, of water. We need to keep on doing the research and, and help out these area lakes to, to keep it clean. I would love to just jump and go to the lake I live on, but that's over 1,500 acres. Uh, Senator French is very, very familiar with, with that lake. Um, this amendment would add it to French Lake, which is in Rice County. Um, you know, it, it's probably... 15, 20 minutes from my house. It's in Senator Jasinski's district. Uh, this lake is 875 acres approximately. The, the lake that you have in your bill, and thank you for that, on line 5.24, Lake Alice, is about 31 acres. So if we're really going to test uh, this process and, and, and keep on supporting uh, innovation, I think we need to go to the next kind of size of lake, and I think French Lake would be a good uh, process. It is in the warmer part of the state where we have probably more of an issue than the northern part of the state, Senator Herr. Um, so that's my plea um, for, for just a little extra to try it on another lake. It would be in the southern half of the state where we, we get green pretty easy. Um, compared to the north part of the state. So, thank you. Senator Herr yeah. on the amendment. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator Rehai, and thank you, uh, Chair Marty, um, for um, hearing this part out. And um, yes, this, this, uh, this concept has been in, talked about in the Environment Committee, and uh, it showcased very well uh, on the lake cleanup. Uh, it's, um, it's, like, it's a pilot pro project, as, as I see, see here. We did put some dollars uh, into Lake Alice, as a smaller lake, but uh, um, 
I like to hear, I, I, there's two, two groups of people that like to hear and present it to the committee, and I want to leave the decision to you. I know that, uh, you know, in terms of financing the box up here. And after, after we go to the floor of the conference committee, I can take on from that point. But number one question is I want to see if, if this will throw the budget off balance and like to hear from Mr. Miller. And then I also want to see, uh, because we're taking these dollars from the uh, community resiliency uh, project, which is uh, part of MPCA, and I want to see if they're open to that. Uh, the reason I had that $75,000 is because MPCA was open uh, for it as a pilot project. Sure. Let's hear from MPCA. Go ahead. Welcome to the committee. Please identify for yourself and go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Tom Johnson, uh, Government Relations Director for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, this project, uh, the 74,000, I believe that's in there, 75,000 that's in the bill currently, was um, billed as a, as a pilot project. At the time, uh, the MPCA had not heard any uh, uh, information about this project. Uh, I think we're still receiving information from the project proposer, so have not as of yet vetted this project. I think we left it up to the chair um, to make the decision to include in the bill as a pro uh, pilot project, and I think the the current funding amount uh, from our perspective is is uh, uh, appropriate for um, for a pilot project on one lake, and uh, and we'll certainly continue to and are open to evaluating this project and the technology um, that's being proposed here. But uh, at this time, we would. Uh, be opposed to additional funding being pulled out of this Resilient Communities Grant Program, which is meant uh, for communities to become more resilient to the effects of climate change, which this is not Chair, fitting the bill for. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, and, and thank you for, for that. And you know, this, this is intended as a, family, a friendly amendment, uh, Senator Herr, and you know, I, I, I do think, um, you know, come, come out to my house in July, and see the lakes in southern Minnesota, um, it's pea soup. And they claim this takes care of it. And, I, you know, I, I think there's a big difference in, in location of lakes uh, and obviously size. You know, my, my lake happens to have 26 inlets, quite a big watershed. Probably a little different than this Lake Alice, and I and I'm, I'm just supportive of the project wherever it is, but but I do think if you want a true picture, you should be in the southern half of the state, where the weather is warmer, and the water temperature is warmer. But Chair, I, I guess I just ask you, I will withdraw this amendment, and if you will continue to to look at it, and if during conference committee or, or something, if you could get it snuck in, if it meets your your uh, your goals of your committee, I'd really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Could you say you're withdrawing the amendment? I, I will uh, okay. withdraw it. Amendment is withdrawn. Um, no, didn't Senator mind. Friends. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Herr, for presenting an excellent bill. I have um, what I think is a friendly amendment, which is the A31 amendment, Mr. Chair. Of course. Yeah. A thirty one amendment is that in the packets, I believe. Yes, it is. Does everybody have it in their packets? A thirty one. It's a short one. It says medical device online. Senator Friends, you want to explain the sure. amendment? Thank you very much, Mr. Sure. Chair, and again thank you, Senator Herr. The A31 amendment is what is not going to be the last time we're trying to define which PFAS-related devices are banned, which are allowed, and which ones we're still working on. In this particular amendment, Mr. Chair, at line 1.5, the subdivisions which ban PFAS, the language says, do not apply to a prosthetic or orthotic device 
or to any producer that is a medical device or drug that is otherwise used in a medical setting or in a medical application regulated by the United States FDA. And so again, members, um, for the environment jurisdiction, you will hear a lot about PFAS. This amendment sets out a category of products that will be allowed for the time being at least. And I understand that Senator Herr has uh, heard about this amendment and hope it will be considered a friendly amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Herr. Yes, uh, thank you, Senator Prince. I has um, been in touch with Senator Hoffman and I also heard that Senator uh, Seeberger, you know, are um, aligned on this um, with amendment. So, you know, I, before I make an absolute decision here, you know, I just want to say that I heard from both members and their support of it. So that would lead me to confirm, pass on their, their, their answer to you that I will accept this as a friendly amendment. Chair. I Further discussion. Senator Drehan. Thank you. I, Senator France stole, stole one of my ideas here. Um, Senator Herr, when, uh, thank you. It's a great amendment. Better write that down. Um, you know, one of the things, I think the definition of the PFAS that we have in this bill, which I think is a very worthy cause, but is very broad. And I, I am a little concerned about what it will do. And one of my concerns was, of course, the medical, especially the pharma industry, uh, which they use the broad definition of a PFAS um, in the manufacturing of, of a lot of prescriptions that I'm sure many people in this room take. Um, so I, I, I'm glad to hear you will support it, but I think we need a bigger discussion on that broad definition in here of what a PFAS is. And uh, thank you for the time. Further discussion, A31 amendment. Senator Dames. Question for the author. Uh, you mentioned when you were going through the amendment, the producer, and I do not see that in the amendment. I see product, but not producer. Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, if I said producer, I clearly misread the amendment. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure if that's what you wanted, it was in there. Further discussion, A31 amendment. If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. Oh, yeah. Senator Friends, you have something else. I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. I have the A33 amendment. Not to be confused with the previous A33. Is this in the packets, it looks like, as well? I hope so, Mr. Chair. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. This is an amendment that I understand has the support of St. Louis County and the Department of Natural Resources. I don't know if they want to come forward and testify, but essentially in Senator McEwen's and Senator Hochschild's district, this involves a land exchange for St. Louis County. Essentially, as we know, Duluth is a seaway port, and this uh, gives them the authority to access land to consider possible expansions at the point Again, I'm told that St. Louis County and the DNR support this. I see Mr. Meyer in the audience. I, I'm not suggesting that he be called forward, but I'm not saying he can't be. And I um, understand Senator Herr has also been brought up to speed on this and would also possibly consider this a friendly amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Senator Herr, should we go ahead? Um, yes, yeah, thank, thank you, Senator Friends. And while we were having a long uh, session today, uh, this, this was discussion, discuss, um, uh, behind the scene um, between uh, uh, Senator, Senator House Chow and uh, the DNR uh, and Senator Friends and uh, brought to my attention that there, there's peace in the valley and I know Mr. Meyer is here too, but uh, I wonder if Mr. Meyer want to confirm Mr. that he's, the DNR is okay. Forward. If the DNR is okay, uh, I will be supportive of it as well. Welcome to the committee. Mr. Chairman, members, for the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources. I'm going to solve a little confusion here because Senator Friends actually has two amendments that deal with St. Louis County. We support both of them. Um, the one he described is the, I think he transposed the descriptions possibly, but we support both of them. One is to deal with the Duluth Port Authority. 
uh, transferring some tax forfeit land and allowing a longer lease term than possible. And the other one deals with a, a land exchange we're working on with the permanent school fund uh, dealing with Saxim Bog. It's the third section of a large exchange that allows for some provisions on there as well. So we support both amendments and they're good amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Myers. So, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Meyer, I'm just kind of curious about, so we're gonna do the exchange and then in section 21, we're, we're um, giving St. Louis County the, the authority or the direction then to sell that property? Mr. Chairman, Senator Pratt, this is tax forfeited land at St. Louis County that we hold the trust for to St. Louis County. The reason why it's in the lands is because it's, it's shoreland. And you can see what, what we're really trying to do. Um, it's consideration for more than $50,000 per year for to exceed 25 years to support this capital investment at the port area. Our main concern was that we weren't conveying um, any of the, 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 the water rights, surface water rights, and that has been addressed within the amendment. Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, Mr. Myers, so we're going to do the land exchange, the land that St. Louis County will get valued at a minimum of 125% of the land it's conveying will then be sold by private sale. Mr. Chairman, yes. Okay. And the, the reason for that different amount is to deal with the permanent school fund requirements that th these lands are going to be used for um, wetland credits. And it's to make sure that the value, that the permanent school fund is getting the entire, the best value possible for this, rather than just a straight percentage. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Meyer, every time I see the word notwithstanding, I get a little nervous. Um, why are we notwithstanding in this case, uh, current statute? I just need to pull up 9434 really quick, Mr. Chairman. Senator, Senator Pratt, question. Are you asking, are you talking about that line 1.4? Is that? 2.3. 2.3. 2.3, yeah, and 30, yeah, 3.0 and 3.1. Okay. Yeah, why no competitive bid? Mr. Chairman, Senator Pratt, there are actually I'm, so we're working off of the A, I'm really confused on the A34 amendment or the A33? A33. A33. Okay. So there are several notwithstanding terms in there. Subdivision 2 on 1.20, notwithstanding on 1.28. Um, these are all specific sections of law that relate to land requirements. So the 120, the 94, 34, subdivisions 3 or 5, allows them to exchange a combination of lands and money that would be valued at least 125% of the, the land reference. 9434 says it has to be substantially equal value. So actually we're exchanging for more than equal value because the property, once it's in the developer's hands, is going to generate revenue. These are school trust fund lands and we're trying to get the best value for the trust. So we're notwithstanding that it has to be the same value and allowing them to actually get more value, 125% of the state land value is what it will be, uh, the value will be exchanged for, if I'm making any sense. I think he's interested in the second notwithstanding, why no competitive bidding? And went on line 30, 31 of page two. This, this land exchange, as I said, was the third, is the third phase of the Saxim Bog exchange going to the same company, ERP. So it's, it's complicated. It's between the Conservation Fund, St. Louis County, Permanent School Trust Fund, and then 
ERP as well. So that's why it has that notwithstanding that it may sell to a, to a private owner to fee without public sale. It's the third phase of, a, of an already going on project completed to complete the project. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Meyer, I'm, I'm just a little bit confused. So it would make sense if the land that we were exchanging were in the school trust lands, but the land that we would acquire and potentially sell, the state would already own those properties. They wouldn't be in the school trust, school land trust. Or what am I missing? So the section, the section 21 allows the county to sell 80 acres of county fee land directly to the, the EIP project proposed, or that's what that notwithstanding of section 21 is. The exchange is, it's, the amendment allows DNR St. Louis County to enter into a land exchange involving 6,000 acres of school trust fund county fee and tax forfeited lands located in the Saxon Bog in St. Louis County. These lands are then going to be exchanged for potlatch lands that were formerly owned by potlatch that the conservation fund now owns. TCA Alpha Conservation Fund has been working with ecosystem investment partners on this project since the beginning. You may recall it started, oh geez, eight years ago probably with the first transaction. Um, they're, they're acquiring the property, breaking some tile basically, getting wetlands credits for it, restoring the bog. It's, it's a beautiful birding area. It's, it's, it's highly rated in the country as a birding area. So they're creating wetland credits, restoring the bog, then those credits are being sold. So this amendment allows the permanent school fund in the county to receive the 125% of the value of the state and county lands that will be exchanged. Without the amendment, that value would be capped at 110%. Then it also allows the amendment to exchange, the, the amendment also allow the exchange to proceed despite the commercial quantities of peat on some of the land and despite riparian restrictions in the land exchange laws. So that's the other two notwithstandings. And then the last piece is that 80 acres that they would allow to be sold to a private, um, private directly to EIP. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Meyer, let me, let me see if I can just recap this and see if I got it right. Um, these properties that we expect to acquire and, and that we're trading for are part of a larger um, project that DNR and the school trust lands area have been working on over a period of time, and that's why we're not withstanding the private sale. Thank you. You should be here. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Meyer, just so I understand it too, um, and they're selling it to somebody who is moving tile and restoring wetland and because we want that to happen we don't it may not be sold at the to the best price but to continue the project yes mr chairman yes thank you on senator friends is a 33 amendment is there further discussion if not all those in favor say aye aye opposed motion prevails senator friends why don't we take the other one that you explained earlier Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'd offer the A34. And at one time a few minutes ago, I thought it was uh, Mr. Myers who had them backwards. This is the lease on tax forfeited land um, brought again from Senator Hoschild and has the support, I believe, of both St. Louis County and the DNR. I'm going to turn it over to the DNR immediately right now, this minute, rather than try to explain it any further. But I believe at times uh, this amendment was already discussed in the previous discussion, Mr. Chair, on the A33. To be clear, offering the A34. Senator Herr or Mr. Meyer? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members, uh, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources again. This amendment deals with the Duluth Port Authority and the ability to lease some tax forfeited land in the Duluth Harbor, the shoreland or the, the land area of it. We're okay with that. Our concerns was uh, language that we had added to the amendment, uh, lines 1.14 and 1.23. After the parcel number IDs, it says that we are not accept 
public waters, so we were not leasing any use of the public waters since we can, the state controls the public waters. So we do support the amendment, and it will provide long-term stability for the port area. Discussion on the amendment. Any Mr. amendment Chair. that uses the word thence at least three times has got to be a good amendment. Huh? Mr. Chair. Senator. Um, you know, I'm glad you know that we hear um, the approval from um, Mr. Bob Mayer, my representative yes. DNR, and also with members like Senator Press and uh, yourself, Mr. Chair, who are very knowledgeable in this area. You know, I like to accept this as uh, a amendment. Any further discussion on the 834 amendment? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Is there there's any other amendments? Senator Pappas. Not an amendment, but I have a question. Um, I didn't see any change orders, but just about base funding, either for, um, um, oh my God, I forgot your name. Mr. Mueller, thank you. I was going to say Newman, no. Mr. Mueller, um, or the gentleman from the PCA. So what... Can you tell me what the base is for the capital assistance program? Um, or, or do you know what it is? This is something we also look at in capital investment, so I want to know how much was there already. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, uh, Tom Johnson. Mr. Um, Johnson. Uh, at the... Uh, Pollution Control Agency. The, the capital assistance program is a um, uh, a bonding uh, uh, program. It does uh, it is for projects that receive capital um, assistance through bonding, but the program lives within PCA statutes. Um, so so there's no money in this bill for it. Correct. Okay. Could you also and then maybe the DNR, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, a second question? Go ahead, Senator um, I also wanted to know about the Reinvest in Minnesota program, if that has base funding in this bill, or if that also is a, we're expected to do that in capital investment. Mr. Like Meyer maybe knows. Mr. Yeah. Oh. Mr. Meyer, do you know, is there base funding in this bill for Reinvest in Minnesota? Is that a DNR program? Mr. Chair, Senator Pappas, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner of DNR. Uh, the RIM program resides in Bowser. In Bowser. We okay. have a RIM critical habitat match license pay program and, and a, a critical habitat fund that there is funding in the bill for. But that's it's a kind of Sorry. a confusing term. But the, Bowser has the reinvest in Minnesota program. Mr. Chair, you want to come and speak to this <clears throat> I guess I am <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman uh, John Jasky Executive Director of Board of Water and Soil Resources and, and uh, <clears throat> Senator Pappas no, there is no base in this bill for the RIM programs they're one time funding okay and there's no one time funding in here either or is there there is some in here yes that there's they're, they're in the uh, climate area. I, I could get you to the line items if you'd like to see those for conservation easements. There's grasslands and peatland easements both. If, Mr. Chairman, if you could get that to me, because I just when I'm looking at a capital investment bill, it's just helpful to know if there's other sources of funding. We will do that. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Thank, Thank you. you Any other questions for Mr. Chasky? Thank you very much. Senator Hur. Uh, any other you. amendments or any other discussion? Go ahead, Senator Dreheim. Thank you. And, and thank you, Senator Herr. Um, you know, it looks like a, a well thought out bill. Um, you know, I, I had, I thank you for the um, Section 8, the uh, research um, for the, the um, prion. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, I, I think that's very important. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit about the water safety uh, language that you have in here. Um, I think it starts on section 12 and article 2. Um, just to clarify, um, you know, having a 14-year-old that went through this a couple years ago, um, 
I, I, I see a bunch of changes to that program and um, kind of some broader definitions the way it looks. Um, can, you, can you just explain what the objective was on, on making these changes uh, for, for the definitions? Okay, uh, thank you, Senator Dre. I can uh, uh, defer to Mr. Stanley and also the DNR is also here as well. So if we further, the DNR can so, talk about it. Mr. Stanley or DNR? Mr. Chair, members, um, there's sort of several things going on with this language, and Senator Dreheim is correct. The, the relevant sections are sections 12 through 17, and then there's a few towards the end. Um, there's some changes that I'll describe, and then there's also just some reorganizations of the statute. So there is some language here that's new. There's also some language that's just being moved around a little bit. The main change, and I think the one that Senator Dreheim is probably asking about, is on page 54 in the definition of adult operator. And so essentially what this would require is that anybody who is 12 or older have a watercraft operator's permit, uh, depending on the phased-in uh, dates that you see on lines 8 through 11 there. So eventually, once, once the uh, sort of cascading effective date is complete, uh, anybody who is 12 years of age or older, born after July 1st, 1987, would have to have a watercraft operator's permit in order to operate a motorboat, motorboat or a personal watercraft on the waters of the state. And so um, currently there is no requirement that uh, persons over 12 have such a permit. The way you get the permit is by completing a DNR-administered course. Um, uh, training course and then you get a permit and so this would extend that requirement to people age 12 or older I can, There's other parts I can talk about but I'll just leave it at that unless Senator Draham has any other questions Mr. Chair Senator Draham. Thank you and so I, that's kind of what I was thinking that so if you're 35 or whatever the age is or older a year after this is enacted and the phase time period kicks in you would have to go online and take uh, a test just like my my 14 year old did a couple years ago is that correct yes there is a different section uh, mr. chair Senator Dreheim it is I'll tell you in a second here section 15 on page 56 that talks about the course that the DNR operates my understanding and uh, assistant commissioner Meyer can supplement this if he wants but my understanding is that the language here is essentially just putting in place what's already happening happening I don't think there is a, a huge change in the contents of the course that would be required if this were enacted from what happens today thank you uh, mr. chair if I could continue continue thank you um, so the, the big thing is you're, you're putting things in statute but the big takeaway is uh, oh, no. probably the horsepower uh, requirements, and then eventually everybody's going to have to take a boat permit to drive a, a boat or a personal watercraft or a pontoon. Mr. Stanley. Mr. But Chair, Member Senator Dreheim. Yes, and I should point out that this is one of the cases, I think the language you're asking about now dealing with horsepower, that's also on page 56. Some of this language looks new because it's being moved from elsewhere, but these uh, exceptions uh, and requirements and limitations were in place under the current law. So for example, uh, young operators, those under 12, under current law cannot operate a motorboat that exceeds 75 horsepower. And similarly, there was an addition in the uh, committee, the previous committee, that added the language that you see on lines 13 through 16, the exemption for under 25 horsepower. That is also reinstating what is in current law. So there, the horsepower limitations have not changed substantially in this bill from what the current law is. Mr. Chair? Senator I, I didn't, and, and uh, Ms., maybe Mr. Meyer could answer this. I didn't remember a horsepower requirement on personal watercraft in the past for 12 years and older. 
He's, he joined you on the table. He's on the other side. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Meyer, go Mr. Ahead. Chair, uh, Senator Dreheim, uh, you are correct. There used to, there currently is a, a horsepower prohibition and age prohibition based on age. This actually isn't a DNR bill, but it's language the DNR supports to bring boats in line with ATVs, off-road motorcycles, and snowmobiles, where if you are, that has the same, we call it a born-on date. So if you're 35 years old, you need to have a, a snowmobile safety certificate, for example, firearm safety certificate, ATV certificate. So this would bring boating into that same realm. What, what we're trying to get after is um, the problematic uses of boating, that people seem to have uh, lack ethics sometimes when they're on the water for other people, especially with these big boats that create huge wakes and there's surfing behind them and the erosion that's caused by that. Um, people can go and rent those lakes on a lot of lakes, Lake Minnetonka, without any training at all. And we're concerned about uh, health and safety and, and impacts to the water bodies. That there's a lot of um, user conflict going on with these larger boats throughout the state. And um, Minnesota Lakes and Rivers Coalition, I believe the National Marine Manufacturers and other boating and fishing organization groups support this language, trying to get some training in the hands of people who either <coughs> own or operate these boats. And we have dealt with or tried to work with the community of Minnesota resorts and other uh, entities as this language has been moving forward. It was similar to language that was introduced and heard last year as well, last session. Okay. Thank you. So under uh, Section 14, operating personal watercraft and other motorboats, um, adult operators um, may not operate a motorboat or personal watercraft unless they have a valid license um, or exempt operator. Um, so I, the way I read that for personal watercraft is that I would I would need to get a boat permit because isn't that a admit maybe Mr. That, Stanley? Yep. Yep. So me I've had jet skis for literally thirty five years and and now I'm going to go have to go get a permit to drive the jet skis I currently own. Mr. Mr. Stanley. Mr. Chair, members, um, I think there were two questions there, Senator Dreheim. Uh, the answer is to your first question is yes, this language does apply to both motorboats and personal watercraft. And the answer to your second question is unless you were born after July 1st, 1987, you would not, you personally would not have ever fall within the, the requirements of this language. And that, and I get to that point by looking at the definition of adult operator. Thank you. Uh, that's all my questions on on that section. And one more question, just a quick one: a motorboat rental business, you would have to have. In other words, you'd fit the same categories. You'd have to have one if you're born after 1987 you at least eventually have to have the operator permit or you could not rent it. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members, um, on the technical amendment that you first adopted when this bill was taken up, the very last couple of changes dealt with resort businesses and exempted those businesses from requirements that uh, motorboat rental businesses otherwise have to comply with. So. Under the language, they're required to administer a small test, a sort of an abbreviated test to those who, who rent. Uh, they have to verify that the boater has a watercraft operator's permit and is over 18. And they would have to provide the renter with a summary of boating regulations. But in the amendment that you adopted, you exempted um, resort businesses from those requirements. That does not mean that an adult operator isn't still subject to those requirements, but the obligation of the resort business to do the, the things that I just mentioned is no longer present in the bill. So if they're renting wake boats or something, they wouldn't need to provide the instructions about staying away from shorelines or whatever? 
Uh, right. Under the, they would not have to do what resort businesses have to do under this bill. I don't know what they do today under that situation, but. Is there further, Senator Dreheim on this point? Go yeah, ahead. on this point. I, sure. You know, I, I think, I don't know if they've come up with the guidance yet for the wake boat, board, boats. Um, I, I don't know. Have we adopted the recommendations on that, Mr. Meyer? On, I know there's a proposal to kind of treat it like a jet ski where you have to keep it 200 feet away from docks and, and whatnot, but I, I, we don't really have a standard um, that's been adopted for that, um, for erosion, and, and I think that is part of the discussion that's going on. But I, I do have, when we're on another topic, I'd like to talk about fish kills. Okay, and first, before we get to that, Senator Pratt, then Senator Friends, and then back to Senator Drake. Senator Friends. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Hur, I appreciate this provision, although this is a substantial change in the requirements of Minnesotans for boating and watercraft, and I think we're going to hear quite a bit about it. My question, Mr. Chair, is simply, if this did not come from the DNR, where did it come from? Uh, Ms. Senator Friends, uh, this is Senator Morrison's bill, and uh, we heard in committee, and I think uh, the DNR was part of it, too, uh, as well. Mr. Chairman, just to provide clarification, it's not an agency bill, one that we go through the governor's office and then the jackets go to you. It was introduced uh, through advocates working with Senator Morrison, the Lakes and Rivers Coalition, as I spoke. Um, <laughs> other groups, marine manufacturers have been involved in the conversation. I know Minfish has been involved in the conversation as well. And to Senator Strahan's comments about setbacks and things, the hope is that through proper education, teaching the children when they're in their boats to tell their parents to operate the boats properly, we can avoid the setbacks and all of those um, conversations that we had when the jet ski laws and the jet skis first came out. So it's through education and, and coaching kind of to help people get into the rhythm of proper boating regulation. Senator Dreheim, now to the next topic. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I'll try to keep this short. I only have a couple more questions. Um, on, the, on the fish kill, at section 41 on page 72, members, um, under the definition, um, and reporting I think is a great thing, so thank you for, for having that. Uh, but my question has to do with the 25 fish in, in a mile. Um, that, that doesn't seem like a lot of fish. Where, where did we come up with this uh, 25 uh, number, Senator Hurt? Uh, thank you, Senator Drehain. I would ask the DNR, you know, Ms., uh, Mr. St uh, Stanley, to um, clarify. This is uh, this is Senator Kunish' uh, provision. Mr. Stanley, you want to take a stab at it? Mr. Chair, members, um, this was just how the bill was drafted, and uh, I I couldn't tell you anything about that. Uh, Mr. Mr. Meyer, you want to comment again? Mr. Chairman, members, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources. Uh, this is a bill that the PCA, the DNR, and others have been working on. I believe it's a Senator McEwen bill. Um, that 25 number is an arbitrary number that the stakeholders had put in the draft language. Uh, it is kind of a small number, especially based on conditions, especially with spring kill, or, or ice out, I should say, uh, winter freeze. There will be hundreds of fish in lakes, as you may see in your area, hopefully not. But um, it's one we're willing to work on and, and, and discuss with people um, what that means. And maybe in different systems, in, in a stream system, a mile is 25 fish isn't a lot. But in one concentrated area, 25 fish could be a big signal that something's wrong. So um, we're willing and open to working on that conversation. Thank you, uh, Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Meyer. And, and Senator Herr, I'd, I'd love to work with you on, on that, and I, I think it needs to be massaged a little bit. I think the reporting is great. We should have had it a long time ago, but I, I, I think it's a really small number in the grand scheme. If you've ever been on a lake that has a fish kill, 
Um, there's hundreds, if not thousands of fish, uh, depending on the situation. Um, and, and maybe it's different for streams and, and different bodies of water. But from a lake standpoint, I, I think this is just uh, um, a little bit of overkill uh, on the number. So I would hope we can work on that between now and, and uh, conference committee. Sounds and then if I could, um, the last, I promise, Chair, the last thing um, I have uh, is really on the uh, composting grants. Um, I, I have a, a question, I guess, ab about that program. Um, in my new district, I have a composting site that they truck material in from out of state. Oh. And oh. Uh, food waste. And, and, I, and I assume that this is part of this program. And I have hog farmers calling me and complaining about this. And I don't know if Senator Frentz has heard any of this uh, since we're, our districts are very close. Um, but it's in a very rural part of my district. And, um, you know, we're accepting waste from a, a, another state coming in. So is this provision in your bill, Section 53 and 54, expanding that program, and does it have any uh, guide rails on it to stop uh, other states from shipping in um, their, their waste? Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, I, I'd like to call PCA to, this is an agency bill, um, just the PCA that, um, PCA and Mr. Johnson, welcome back to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, Tom Johnson, uh, MPCA. Uh, these sections are um, primarily changing an existing uh, grant program to make um, more use of, uh, we have a waste hierarchy, as you may, as the committee may be familiar with in Minnesota, uh, composting, recycling, uh, handling of food waste, to your point, are higher up the hierarchy than, say, landfilling, waste energy. And so uh, this is just making sure that there's uh, more usage of those uh, better types of handling waste up the hierarchy. And so I would say uh, I'm not sure to your question if there's any guide rails about uh, bringing waste in from outside the state, but um, that's the, the purpose of these sections. Mr. Chair? I, I see that they can request up to 250000 or less. Uh, Small amounts. What's it? Small amounts. Yeah. Um, which which I, I hope we're not funding other states' waste, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. And I don't think that was an intent uh, of this program. So I, I guess what I'm looking for is a little guidance uh, from the author. And, and I guess the agency too, um, you know, is there something we can do to tighten up the program, which I think is a good program, but I, I, I don't think we're doing any favors by hauling waste in um, a couple hundred miles probably. Um, I don't see how that's helping the environment. Um, so I, I, you know, it'd be one thing if it was somewhere in Minnesota coming down, but it's literally coming from a different state. And um, I, I think it kind of defeats the purpose or of the intent of the program. So I, I guess I'd ask Senator Her once again if we can work on this between now and, and conference committee to to try to find some peace in the in the valley to to put some guide rails on that. Senator Her, yes, uh, Senator Reheim, I'm, I'm open for the discussion. We can work, talk offline about it. Uh, I'm curious to know uh, what other, what what trash or what other state that we brought the trash in into our state, and you know we need to look at that you know carefully, uh, and and figure figure a process of guardrail as you say, you know I also look forward to uh, work with you on the number of fish kill, um, you know it's an opportunity number as we heard, so you know I'm open uh, for for your suggestion, but uh, in consultation with the DNR. Of course, thank you. Senator Pappas. Mr. Chairman, of course, I want to know from Mr. Johnson how much there is in that grant program. And that's for recycling and waste, 
is that involve also anaerobic digesters. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the the changes um, to that specific grant program, I am not exactly sure how much is going through that specific program. We do have an overall package that you'll see. I don't have the line number. Maybe Mr. Mueller has it in front of him. But the Waste Prevention Grants and Loans uh, appropriation goes to a number of different grant programs that are existing within the agency. And that's for, an, uh, I, I can send materials to the agency, but that's for wasted food, food rescue, waste prevention and reuse projects, market development for uh, the sustainable buildings and materials programs, organics programs, expanding markets, preventing planning for wood waste. Um, and that is 16.94 million uh, was the Gov's Rex, uh, 16.94 million in 2024 and 2025 uh, in the Senate bill here. Maybe Mr. Mueller has it in front of him. Mr. Mr. Mueller. Um, Mr. Chairman and members, the, the appropriation is on line is on page 16 of the bill and the Senate there are a couple different programs that PCA has that deals with some of the recycling programs the new amount for the new grant program that, that the PCA mentioned is thir the Senate has 13.94 million in each year of the biennium mm -hmm. um, I see that. but also note there is another program that deals with uh, recycling um, that goes that's a million dollars per year um, that's an ongoing program and then there's also the score grants so there's a couple of different sort the score grants is an annual month that goes out to all counties and then there's the recycling program and then the new program that the PCA mentioned as far as anaerobic or the digesters that you mentioned I don't believe that that covers that any of these grant programs would cover that um, those proposals Mr. Chairman, if you could just let me know where I could, yeah. or, or Mr. Johnson, where I could get more information about those programs. Happy to follow up. Thanks. Further discussion on the bill? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to kind of follow up on this line of questioning, so I'm looking at this $13.94 million uh, are for waste prevention and reduction grants and loan programs, and that seems extremely broad. Um, Mr. Johnson, it, it sounds like the, the agency has some uh, some ideas that would tighten that language up, and I think it would make this bill a lot better if we could adopt that on the floor. Uh, I've just th this just seems to be a little too open ended for my comfort, and I would hope that we could agree that we want to put some more guardrails around it, so we're putting the right uh, we're we're being transparent in what the what the uh, objectives are because I do know that because I believe isn't it, St. Louis County is still doing a, a waste um, a waste analysis and what is that expected to be due Mr. Johnson uh, Mr. Chair I'll have to get this specific um, date I believe it's either later this year or, or early next year but I'll, I'll get that uh, to you Senator Pratt and, and I, we are absolutely open, uh, Mr. Chair and, and Senator, to um, putting more specifics in the appropriation language if that's uh, desired by the committee and, and by the chair. Um, uh, we're happy to do that. I think uh, that might have just been an oversight when we were preparing uh, appropriation language. So. Senator Herr and Senator Pratt perhaps can meet with the department try and figure out some tighter language. Is there further discussion on the bill? If not, Senator Friends moves that the contents of Senate File 24, 2847, excuse me, the Energy Bill as amended, um, be added into the Senate File 2438, and staff be instructed to make technical and conforming changes. On that motion, is there Mr. any? Chair? Yes, Senator Pratt. Did we take Senator Francis's bill off the table? We are going to take the content of it. I, do we have to take it off the table first? I think we're just adding. We would have, if we did it the other way. We would have to take it off the table. Thank I think you. it's okay to do it that way, though. We also have to put it in the House file yet. 
Senator Friends moves the contents of his bill, Senate, 20, Senate file 2847, excuse me, and add that to Senate file 2438, Senator Hur's bill, and direct the staff to make technical and conforming changes. On that motion, any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion prevails. Senator Her moves, Senator Her can't make the motion. Senator Friends moves that we amend House File 2310 by adding the contents of Senate File 24, 28, 24, 30, excuse me, 2438 as amended. Um, the content, the title and contents of House File 2310 be stricken and replaced with the title and contents of Senate File 2438 as just amended. Okay, never mind. <laughs> uh, Senator Friends moves that we lay Senate File 2438 on the table. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Uh, we Senate file, Senator Friends moves that we take House File 2310 off the table and insert in it the contents of what I just said, namely Senate File 2438 as amended. Is there any discussion of that motion? If not, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Now, Senator Friends moves that House File 2310, as amended, namely the two bills we've just dealt with, be recommended to pass. On that motion, is there any further discussion? Mr. Chairman? Senator Pappas. Did you put 2847 into House File 2310? Did I miss that? You did do that. Yes. We did put... Okay, great. Yes. Thank you. Um... I hope we are. <laughs> On Senator Friends' motion that um, House File 2310 be recommended to pass, as amended, be recommended to pass. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion prevails. With that, we have, Senator Chairman. Hurt, thank you uh, and yes, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all members for staying very late uh, to uh, finish, uh, to do our due diligence. Uh, to finish this uh, process and look forward to work with you and also uh, present this bill in the House and uh, no, present this bill in the Senate. Um, also thank council like uh, Ms. COVID, uh, Mr. Becker and Mr. Norman and also um, my two reliable council here, Mr. Stanley, Mr. Mueller, my staff and Cassie and also Kara and my cow who stay with us at this late and the agency as well, the MPCA. Bowser, DNR, um, who else? <laughs> Still here. The PFAS and also the Farmer Union, a number of them back there. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman. For members of the committee, you I'm, want to hear plans? I'm sorry, I don't want you to adjourn until I ask a question. <laughs> you can't, I was going to tell you plans too, but go ahead. Um, before you tell us plans, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> according to the agenda, we only have one bill tomorrow, so Senator Muhammad, Muhammad would really, really appreciate it, since she eats at 3.30 in the morning, if we could come Starting in a little later 345? tomorrow. 345? 345 she eats, right. 345 a.m.? <laughs> Senator <laughs> Sir Champion, you're up by then. Oh, we are. I know you are. Um, I think... I think despite Senator Muhammad's wish that we could start earlier, I, I'm going to recommend, and it's hard to know with the committee how long things will take, I'll recommend 9.30 in the morning. Sorry, <laughs> the, With that, this committee will adjourn until we will convene tomorrow morning at 9.30 to take up the E-12 bill and Senator Kunis. Thank you very much for staying around. Meetings adjourned. Thursday it is.